Hi, Veronica. Hi, Meredith. Hi, Allison. It's Veronica. Just Hi, trying. Veronica. How are you doing? Pretty good. Excellent. Happy Monday. Hi, Meredith, how are you doing? Oh, Meredith, you're muted. <laughs> That's right, I forgot. <laughs> you probably don't have to hang out the first hour or whatever. But of course you cool. can, fascinating. <laughs> you, can, you can hop on anytime. Yeah, I'll probably leave my computer here, but I may I may duck out and hang out with kiddo for a little bit. Um, yeah, I should have told you guys that, but just make sure the connections work and whatever. Yep. Um, so I've got I have a I have our PowerPoint pulled up on on my computer. So we sh cool. I should be able to I'm set up so I can share right. Yes, yeah, Chris. So I have all City of Boulder employees are set up as co-hosts, meaning you can share, you can unmute, mute yourself. So um, if you want to try right now to share, you can, but you do have that ability right now, yeah. Okay. Yep, looks like it can. But it's always okay. good to test it out. <laughs> yeah, well, let me, let me start. Meredith, I was curious if my badge still worked at Park Central, and uh, so I went down there today and I... It, Miraculously did, and I saw what where we used to work. <laughs> uh, yeah, totally so different. Huh? There. Yeah, it's yeah. all wide open and very different. Yeah, but not finished, right? 
I don't think it's done yet. No. This a big open so. mess. Yeah. <laughs> You know, floor, actually, <laughs> somebody somebody had a meeting in there. There was there was um, a bunch of notes on some um, some whiteboards. So maybe they've opened some of that stuff up. Hmm. Yeah, they were working on it. I sure haven't heard it it's open yet. But the meeting <clears throat> rooms are starting to uh, get busy. Yeah. Good to go. Chris. So are you? Are you guys able to see that? Yes, looks good. Perfect. Okay. Perfect. I will stop. I will mute. Coming back here in a little bit. To see you. Okay, let's go ahead and let people in. All righty. Thank you so much. <clears throat> All right, good evening. Oh, great, I'm so glad we're recording this. There we go. <laughs> it, is, it is recording right now. 601 on uh, Monday, December 13, uh, 2021. I will call to order now the uh, December meeting for the Transportation Advisory Board for the City of Boulder. Thank you for joining us. It appears everyone's in on the wait room, waiting room. Um, we have no public hearing items and our agenda is frightfully short this evening. Um, but I will begin by handing it over to Alison Moore Farrell, who is going to be our technical host for the evening to run through our uh, rules and expectations for an online Zoom meeting. But thank you for joining us, Alison, go ahead. Wonderful, thank you so much, Sheila. Um, so to go over our meeting rules this evening, this meeting has been called to conduct the business of the city of Boulder. Activities that disrupt, disrupt, delay, or otherwise interfere with the meeting are prohibited. The time for speaking or asking questions is limited to three minutes. No person shall speak except when recognized by myself, and no person shall speak for longer than the time allotted. Each person shall register to speak by using that person's real name. Any person believed to be using a name other than the one they are commonly known by will not be permitted to speak at the meeting. No video will be permitted except for city officials, employees, and invited speakers presenters. All others will participate by voice only. The person presiding at the meeting shall enforce these rules by muting anyone who violates any rule. If the chat function is enabled, which it is, it will be used for individuals to communicate with the host myself. It should only be used for technical online platform related questions. If an attendee attempts to use chat for other reasons, the city reserves the right to disable that person's access to chat. Only the host and individuals designated by the host will be permitted to share their screen during the meeting. Thanks, Tila, back to you. Thanks so much, Allison. Uh, I will proceed at the moment to um, the consideration of the approval of the November meeting minutes. Uh, do any tab members have any corrections, amendments, or, or uh, other changes to the minutes? I see a couple of shaking heads. I have no substantive changes. Looks like no one else does either. So I'll entertain a motion to approve the minutes, the drafts that were um, circulated and made part of our packet. I'll move that we approve these, but I do have a comment on minutes in general after this. Okay. Alex moves to approve, I'll second that. Any objection? Terrific, the minutes are approved, thank you. Alex, you're still on mute, go ahead. In October, we had the opportunity to weigh in on the concept plan for the apartments on Spruce. And as Jacob Lindsay noted, it was this historical opportunity for TAP to weigh in on, on something that was under concept review. And our recommendations and the projects in concept review form moved on to city council later that month. And I, when looking through their materials, I was looking for our motions and only found one of the two motions that this board passed printed in those materials. And I was pretty sure that we had two and to confirm that I went to go check our meeting minutes and that entire agenda item is missing from our October minutes. It skips from agenda item 
five to seven. So neither of our motions were, were captured in our minutes. Um, and th this just comes on the heels of the East Arapaho seep motion being a little misplaced. And last year when we were passing a motion on the removing the north or the um, table mesa overpass from the CIP, we were told that our additional work verbiage was not necessary. So just want to draw attention to board members that we need to be a little cautious as we review our materials and to staff that there's this there's several examples in the past year or so where we've taken the time to read all of the information provided to us, listen to members of the public, deliberate amongst ourselves, craft particular language, and it's it's going missing. Thanks, Alex. Mark, do you have a comment on that? Uh, I do. Um, uh, when I became aware, you know, so I voted to approve the October minutes. And, um, you know, I, I, I try to give the minutes a careful reading. And, um, uh, you know, I, I, I think I proved to, I moved to approve the October minutes, not realizing that, the, that they had jumped from item five to item seven. And um, this, is, this is an issue that I have experienced in the four years I have been on TAB. It's not just under um, uh, this, this, in this last year. Uh, and, and it's moved, you know, to have our, uh, our deliberations and our motions that we carefully craft um, modified left out entirely um you know it's it's gone beyond um uh annoying and so i want to make a proposal when i became aware of this uh issue in the october minutes on again on the heels of arapaho and and other instances um i i want the tab uh I would like to adopt for us to agree uh, to a formal motion. And that would be that every formal motion that we make as the tab is included exactly and in its entirety in the minutes and, and anything that is conveyed to council completely in its entirety without exception. And I obviously staff is free to comment about why they might disagree with um, the tabs uh, decision recommendations or motions, but they are not free to change omit or mischaracterize our motions. Uh, and the second thing would be whenever a tab recommendation is reported to Council a TAB member is invited to be present with staff in that meeting. So those are the two items that I think um, are necessary for uh, our, um, our deliberations, recommendations, and motions to be conveyed uh, correctly. Thanks, Mark. Um, I see that Erica has had her hand up. Um, I do want to get back to your two points. I think they have merit, but I, she's had her hand up since before you raised them. And I wonder if she has some insight onto this in this uh, omission or mistake. Erica? So I guess, um, you know, so I'm not the person doing the minutes, but I am the liaison between TAB and then the city. And I just wanted to offer my deepest apologies. Um, I am going to go back and we're going to put some processes and procedural things in place so this doesn't happen again. Um, because I agree with you entirely that whenever TAB has a motion and um, you know, you're offering advice and counsel to the council and to staff, we should be able to capture that in the minutes. And um, I'm really sorry. I will go back and um, research with Meredith what happened and put some processes in place so that that doesn't happen going forward. 
Thank you. Alex? Yeah, thanks, Erica. But with the with the spruce thing, it was interesting because somehow one of our motions ended up in the council materials and whoever did that clearly wasn't referencing our minutes. So it was, there was the matter of our minutes missing something, but also someone took the leeway to describe one of our motions and quotes the second, describe the first mm -hmm. one and quote the second one directly. Okay. And I, if we're going to talk about Mark's item that he has brought forward, a friendly amendment I would like to add is that when things go from uh, us to planning board, that they be quoted in their entirety without anything being omitted or modified or merely just summarized by transportation or planning staff. Understood. Um, so let's get back to Mark's two points. Um, again, this gets a little sticky because to make a, a you know, a, a, a motion and take action by tab requires a public hearing, but that doesn't mean we can't like have a, a general consensus among ourselves and among staff that this ought to be happening. Uh, as to Mark's second point that a member of tab ought to be invited, it's certainly uh, the case that a member of tab can come to any um, city council meeting. And I think that the, the distinction is not just that we're allowed, but that we're explicitly um, included, I suppose. Is that about right, Mark? Um, and I think that this was a more real tension, uh, longer ago. Certainly in my time on tab, it has been a tension that has been alleviated somewhat recently um, by staff doing less um, um, summarization and um, sort of editorializing of what happened at TAB and, and, and doing a better job, frankly, of, of conveying the, uh, the substance of TAB's discussions. But I, I am sensitive to, in particular, being accurate. And so I think that uh, your suggestion has some real good merit. Um, and my understanding, of course, is that staff and in preparation of the minutes extends its best and most reasonable efforts. And again, those efforts have been uh, substantially better in recent months um, about capturing more verbatim what our discussion is, um, but we could be uh, more explicit and frankly, we as TAB members could be helping staff better capture the word for word um, yeah, substance of what we are uh, agreeing to. I think um, what happened in October is not, and I'm just sort of catching up right now, but it's, it, that's not an example of us not being um, clear enough um, it, it does sound like mistakes were made and we will, we will go back and, and see what we can do to correct the record. So thank you for catching this, Alex, Mark. Um, I appreciate it. And I would say that um, as far as Mark's two suggestions, we should probably fold them into um, the discussion of our policies and procedures that we have um, tabled to the tab retreat early next year, because this seems um, directly related to the sections of that draft document that deal with um, our expectations between and, and um, our sort of um, relations with and communications between staff and city council. Does that sound fair, Mark? I'm not really sure we can make any solid um, action right now, this evening. I had not thought of that, but I think that's an excellent suggestion. And um, uh, it would allow uh, time for uh, additional careful crafting um, of, of that language. And I think that that's, um, I, I would be amenable to that, especially, uh, thank you, Erica, for um, acknowledging the mistake. And, um, uh, and, and I have been also, at the same time, I've been frustrated with this motion issue, yes, our minutes have improved and, and Meredith has been doing a great job overall in capturing a, um, the, the greater part of our, of our meeting. So um, I am completely fine with that, but especially with kind of a, a tacit agreement or whatever that as we go forward and, and we discuss some issues um, that will be coming before this council, um, that a, uh, a TAB member is invited. And I'm not demanding that 
someone speak every time transportation department presents, but I would like us to be present. And if there is a, um, if there is a delta between what the tab thinks they made in a motion and what they hear being presented to council, that they'd be given an opportunity to say, well, that, that, you know, maybe that wasn't exactly what we said. Here's, here's what mm -hmm. I would like to add to it. Okay. I understood your suggestion to be a little bit more proactive than that. Instead of saying we have an opportunity to correct something that was a discrepancy that we, um, try to have a tab member attend a meeting where there is something that got discussed where we, we don't necessarily completely uh, support the staff suggestion or there's some kind of um, you know alteration to the staff, staff proposal that we try ahead of time to schedule a tab member to attend such a council meeting. I guess what I'm saying is, let's say we have something that's going before council, staff's presenting. It is not customary that a board member demand right demand their three minutes and I, I don't I don't want to be um, uh, that that guy um, but I want it to be known that hey uh, this evening we have uh, the director the assistant director this engineer and this tab member here and this is the information being presented and if the tab member never speaks great right. if they if they feel like an urgency to speaking then they can raise their hand and be part of the um, of the transportation department uh, communications to council, but I, I, I don't want to be uh, saying that, that tab gets um, minutes at council that would be different from another board. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Eric and Natalie. Sorry, <laughs> Erica and Natalie. Does this seem like a rational sort of? tacit agreement at the moment until we have a chance to discuss it more fully and in depth at the retreat. So I, I wouldn't put characterize any of those to, um, my comments and and responding to you know rational or whatever else. Um, I don't know. I mean, this is one of these things where I don't know that I actually have the um, latitude to be able to say, yeah, this is a great idea or, you know, anything different because um, the relationships between the boards and commissions and the council is the relationship between the boards and commissions and council and how that engagement happens. It's, um, it's a different process than staff bringing, you know, a package forward with it and, and so forth, just like the public has mm. its own place and space. And I don't have enough, um, I don't have, you know, I'm not the legal person um, to be able to look through all the, you know, all the guidelines, et cetera, to be able to say, yeah, this is the greatest idea since sliced bread, or it's in conflict with, you know, um, these issues. So what I would say is that um, I have heard what you said, and if we're able to go back and do some research with it, you know, with our um, folks, because I honestly don't know, you know, um, this is a relationship between boards and commissions and council and it's you know it's not a staff thing right um i'm just looking at the agenda this evening it doesn't appear that there's anything that we're going to discuss at this meeting that's going directly to council and going to be reported to council so this doesn't feel like a, a fire we need to put out in this evening um then it gives us a it gives us a month to look into this. Um, I will I said I suppose leave it or my reaction, Erica, to what you just said is that there is definitely an ongoing expectation when a city department reports to city council and there's a transportation advisory board involved. Um, customarily, um, staff reports to council what that discussion was like and reports any decisions made and you know any resolutions. That's usually staff's job when they are reporting to council. And I think Mark is suggesting that we at least have a member of this board um, on standby, I suppose, when such reporting takes place. I think that's more or less where, where, we're, where we're at. I'm getting a thumbs up from Mark. I also see Ryan's hand up, but I would like to move on from this if we can. Ryan. Just wanted to support the, the idea that we uh, look to at least recommend to council uh, uh, an understanding that tab 
um, be present at yeah, a council meeting that involves subject matter that we've waited on. Uh, I don't think it's enough to say a TAB member is welcome to join mm -hmm. uh, because the council member is not going to know to call, especially if it's a study session. And um, I think we're going to get into more and more nitty gritty. I would expect transportation details with so far the new council has shown a great interest in our subjects. And so I just think this is going to be more important than, than it was before. And if there's no clear way forward, I would suggest just we reach out, maybe Tila to the to Mayor Brockett and say, we'd right, like to recommend that you invite us and make this your expectation. Um, there might be a better way, but that would be my suggested default of nothing better. Okay, thank you. Appreciation for that uh, point well taken. Um, I'm gonna leave that there for now then, but thank you again, Alex, um, for highlighting this and Erica for agreeing to look into it. Um, next on our agenda is a, a public comment, but before that, I feel um, as we have done in the past, we need to note uh, that another young man has died on Boulder City streets. Uh, this one was a 24 year old male on the Saturday after Thanksgiving, that would be um, November 27th. Um, uh, in the vicinity of Table Mesa and US 36. Um, my understanding is we don't really have any further details at the moment because investigation is ongoing, but um, this has been not a good year for our streets and to me highlights uh, a lot of work that we still have to do to make travel here safe um, for everyone on our roads. I hate doing this every time. We have no um, public hearing items this evening, but as usual, we have a, um, a moment of, of public comment. Um, typically members of the public, and I see that there are a few here tonight, will have three minutes to comment on anything that they wish to discuss with Tab. Excuse me. So if you're here to comment on the NSMP project on Pine, Mapleton Spruce, or um, the downtown station agenda items, um, this would be your time to do so. We won't have a separate public hearing on those items. And of course, you're welcome to discuss anything else that is relevant to this board's work. Um, I'm going to hand it back over to Allison to, um, to handle the public comment. Thanks, Tila. Thank you. Um, Feel free to raise your hand, Lynn. I know you had your hand up, so I'll go ahead and call on you first. And if you'd like to speak at public comment, please um, raise your hand or type into the chat box. And Lynn, I'm going to ask you to unmute right now and I will pull up the three minute timer behind my background. Yeah, thanks. Although I'd love All to- All right, go ahead. Um, yeah. Um, this miscommunication, it's its hard listening to this. So I've just experienced issues with Boulder Community Hospital and a communicating with a patient representative there that very sweet woman, but like she did not, she, she sent me back what I said and it wasn't what I said at all. So God help us if we can't even communicate at the most basic levels and then communicate between all these different groups of staff and the council and et cetera. So good luck with that. But um, my comments tonight, I wanted to bring up one that I got in a bike crash um, with, I believe what were a couple guys on meth that were just, um, I was just going from the farmer's market on the 9th of November and over to look at one of the landmark houses that I, I follow the landmarks board on 17th and Marine. And so I was on the bike path there and these two guys were there with their dog and the dog was on a leash and the dog somehow, and I'm very cautious person, but somehow to avoid the dog, I had to crash. And, um, you know, um, forward over my bike, I got a hematoma on my left calf and my right knee a little bit and then crashed over my bike onto the cement really hard. And I'm 68, so my bones aren't, you know, what they used to be probably. 
and I don't know what's wrong with me. I've, but it, I couldn't use my arm at all, my right arm for like two days. And it, it's gotten better somewhat since then, but there still feels like there's sprocket is out or there's like some, the socket, my, my lower arm, I can't rotate right. And, and my shoulder and like, and it's pretty disturbing because I just happen to have a kidney stone and don't ever get a kidney stone. Um, but that was a surprise because I never get sick with anything. And so I'm dealing with all of that. So I haven't been to the doctor about this. But my main concern for you folks is please do something about getting a pie chart for each body that's coming to Boulder of what, how much transportation advisory, how much transportation they're using, how much all of the infra different infrastructure, because this millennium and the best Western and see you South, what you said tonight, Tila, right down there at Table Mesa, like that, we can't handle any more population here. And it's just driving the homelessness and the meth people. And I know they're not intentional meth, but they're watching dogs that, that, that the dog is not safe with them either. It's like really disheartening. Yeah, so, okay. I hear you, Lynn, thank you. Yeah. I hope you heal well. Would anyone else the public like to speak? I don't see anyone else. I don't either, so we can go ahead and close that. Okay, we will close the public comment section of the meeting. Lynn, thank you for joining us as always, and I'm, I'm sorry to hear that that happened to you. I hope you feel better soon. Yep. All right, now we will turn to a uh, briefing and tab feedback on the NSMP project on Pine Mapleton Spruce. Everyone hear me? Yep. Hi, Tab. I'm Ryan Knowles, Senior Transportation Planner here at the City of Boulder. And this evening, I just wanted to give you kind of a mid project update on the Whittier NSMP project. So uh, that includes Pine Street, Mapleton Avenue, and Spruce Street between 20th Street and uh, 28th Street. And uh, so a little bit of background just to refresh. Um, so we uh, prioritized, or you prioritized, I should say, this project as the top complex project in the Neighborhood Speed Management Program in 2019. Uh, the applications that uh, comprise this project are actually uh, three, three applications. So there was the top ranked application on Pine Street between 20th Street and Folsom. There was another Pine Street application between Folsom and 28th, which was uh, ranked a few below. And then there was uh, Spruce Street between 24th and Folsom, which was the top ranked simple project. And so uh, when we prioritized Pine Street, we decided to include Spruce Street. Additionally, we included Mapleton because we are concerned that if we further uh, traffic on Pine Street, we may push traffic to Mapleton and Spruce. And so thinking about that potential diversion, we wanted to make sure that we were addressing those streets as well. And of course, the Neighborhood Speed Management Program's primary goal is to reduce vehicle speeding uh, in order to enhance neighborhood livability and improve public safety for all street users in support of our Vision Zero goal, uh, the Transportation Master Plan, as well as the Low Stress Walk and Bike Network Plan. So I just wanted to point out um, the uh, levels of speeding that we saw uh, when we embarked on this project uh, in late spring of this year. And uh, so just as a frame of reference, Pine Street has a 25 mile an hour speed limit. It is a collector street, so it was not affected by the 20th Plenty project. However, Mapleton Avenue and Spruce Street uh, both were affected by 20th Plenty and now have 20 mile an hour speed limits. 
Uh, so we are primarily seeing the uh, majority of speeding on Pine Street between 21st and 23rd, and then uh, west, east of Charleston, rather, uh, between 26th and 27th. On Spruce Street, uh, primarily uh, right around that 2200 uh, block, and then on Mapleton, closer to Folsom. We held our first neighborhood meeting on August 11th at Whittier Elementary School, and we were actually able at that time to hold it in person. Uh, we did it in the schoolyard. We had a really good uh, attendance, about 30 people showed up. Um, so we had it kind of like an open house style format where we put some boards out and we're talking about the existing conditions in the neighborhood and then asking folks for some preliminary feedback on things they would like to see. And so, this slide shows some of that feedback that we received. Uh, and so uh, we've used this feedback to begin developing some pr uh, preliminary options for, uh, for the neighborhood. Uh, so we've categorized these basically into uh, vertical device options as well as horizontal device options. And so you can see the vertical options that we are considering on Mapleton include uh, aprons on the existing traffic circle at 23rd Street, uh, adding additional speed humps, as well as looking at a hardened center line or an ex extension of the, uh, of the uh, pedestrian islands that are currently at Mapleton and Folsom. On Pine Street, uh, some options include a raised intersection at 21st, uh, speed cushions uh, throughout the corridor, Additionally, a apron at 23rd at the existing traffic uh, circle, uh, hardened center lines on the uh, at the Folsom intersection on the uh, north and south approaches of Folsom, and then on Spruce Street, uh, also raised intersection and speed cushions. I should also note um, the uh, recommendation from the Low Stress Walk and Bike Network Plan for Pine Street is to add buffered bike lanes. So there are currently uh, regular bike lanes. So regardless of the other options that we choose to go forward with, we will uh, move forward with adding those buffers to those bike lanes. Horizontal device options we are looking at include on Mapleton adding uh, splitter striping and high visibility crosswalks on the approaches to the traffic circle at 23rd Street. Uh, modifying the right in, right out uh, pedestrian refuge island, what I just kind of alluded to with the hard and center line. Um, on Pine Street, there is an existing uh, pedestrian refuge island on the uh, west leg of the 21st and Pine intersection. So we would, in this option, add a uh, pedestrian refuge island on the east leg. Uh, on Pine Street, there are several intersections that currently have uh, curb extensions. So at 22nd Street, you can see here, we're proposing uh, this is an option to add curb extensions there, um, as well as uh, on Spruce Street at 23rd and 26th. Uh, and then uh, in addition to the splitter islands and high visibility crosswalks, also uh, adding a bike box as a potential option at the Folsom uh, intersection in the east and westbound directions. Uh, pedestrian Island at 26th is also an option, uh, as well as a right in, right out uh, at 28th Street, which I'll talk about in a moment. And then uh, on Spruce Street, again, adding, uh, actually there is an existing, I should say, an existing pedestrian island at 21st and Spruce. And so, uh, one thing we've considered is uh, shortening up the lane tapers on those. Uh, so the, the length of the taper is such that uh, it's a more gradual transition around the island. And so one option is to make that a little more abrupt, which would uh, increase the horizontal deflection around the island. Um, so those are some things that we are considering uh, for the project. Uh, and then that right in, right out, option at 28th and Pine uh, would be very similar to what currently exists at Spruce and 28th. 
And so we are actually going through a uh, separate traffic analysis right now to look at potential impacts to the inter intersections at uh, Mapleton and uh, 28th Street, as well as Pearl and 28th Street. Uh, but should we move forward with this uh, option, we would include it in the construction of the 28th Street project uh, that we presented to you a few months ago. We held our second neighborhood meeting on December 1st, and we did that via Zoom. So I just wanted to give you kind of an overview of what we heard during that meeting. We've also uh, added a recording of the meeting, the uh, slide deck and the online comment form on the NSNP webpage. And so we're continuing to get additional feedback before developing a uh, recommended design, which we would bring to you in the new year. Um, so at Pine and Spruce, or Pine and Spruce Streets rather, between 21st and 24th Street, we heard um, that most of the options actually sounded pretty good to people. Um, the, uh, what was surprising to see in the meeting was uh, that people seemed excited about the traffic circles with aprons because at the first public meeting, we had heard that people did not like the traffic circles so much. Um, we also uh, were surprised to see that that was somewhat popular for uh, Pine Street between Folsom and 28th, uh, but that pedestrian refuge islands were very popular there, especially at 26th Street, which doesn't currently have sidewalks. So, um, so we've gotten some interesting feedback, all that to say. Uh, and we are working on developing uh, what will be most likely a mixture of both vertical and horizontal devices uh, for the recommended design. And we will present that to the public in January um, at a final neighborhood meeting. So the third in the series of three that the NSMP guidelines dictate. And then uh, in March, we will return to uh, you uh, to ask you for your recommendation on a recommended design after holding a public hearing. Uh, should you make that recommendation, we will uh, place the recommended design on the city council's agenda for a potential call-up. And uh, should it move forward, then we will begin uh, finalizing the design and contracting process uh, in late spring, early summer of next year uh, with the goal of beginning construction in the fall. And depending on the devices that we choose uh, from those options that I spoke of, we may have to uh, focus on uh, installing the project in phases. Uh, just for example, if we were to land on raised intersections, those are probably the most expensive traffic calming device in our toolbox, and that would more than likely require us to, to do uh, several phases of the installation of the project. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to take them. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, so, Tab, this is, a, as I said, it's not a public hearing item. We're not approving anything. This would be a great time for questions. Like, I'd like a round of questions if you have any before giving him feedback. So does anyone have questions for Ryan first? Uh, don't see you guys. Ryan, I had two questions. Oh, Mark, you put your hand up. Go ahead, Mark. Well, I I wait as long as I can in the hopes that someone else will jump in there. Gee whiz, I'm sorry. I, I, anyway, um, Ryan, uh, <clears throat> I was uh, going back to the, the, the vertical device option slide, um, if you could. You have the traffic circles where you and Devin and I met at, on 23rd Street uh, and Pine and Mapleton. Um, my question is, um, you label those, well, so are we talking about existing devices, modifying the existing devices or replacing existing devices? Because those, those to my understanding, would be traffic circles without aprons. Correct. So the so the existing device is a traffic circle. We would be modifying it by adding an apron. And the apron, so currently the, the opening between the apex of the 
curb extension at 23rd Street and the outer rim of the traffic circle is about 24 feet. And so we'd be looking at narrowing the, the vehicle path to about 15 by building an apron around the existing radius of the traffic circle. Um, we've spoken with fire and maybe about that. So we're thinking probably a, around two inches high, maybe a little bit more. So is, is everything on this and the next slide either a modification or an addition? No, most of it is a, would be additions. So uh, for example, there is not a speed hump at these locations okay. where we're proposing them. There are existing speed humps on Mapleton, uh, but not at these locations. The speed cushions obviously aren't there. Um, at 21st Street, there's an existing pedestrian island that we would be removing if we were to add a raised intersection. Okay. All right, great. Thank you very much. That was, uh, that was really my only question. I just was unsure what was new, what was existing, but to be modified. But it's mainly uh, new or additions or a modification. But nothing, you're not showing anything that suggests would just remain that, that's in its current state. Uh, we're not showing anything in these graphics that would remain. However, for example, at 21st and Pine, there is an existing pedestrian island on the west leg. Mm -hmm. And so if we added one on the east leg, the one on the west leg would still remain. So it would be a pair. Okay. Thank you. No problem. Okay. Alex. Thanks, Ryan. I think one thing that's cool about this is we have these three close projects that give us this little study area, which then allows us to look comprehensively at, uh, at, a, at a larger area. I'm curious what the crash history is in this study area with regard to severe crashes or crashes involving users, uh, vulnerable road users. Yeah, so the uh, severe crashes will have mostly taken place at the intersection of Folsom and Pine. Um, we, uh, we do have separate funding for um, doing things at that intersection through the Highway Safety Improvement Program. Um, that will include uh, a signal rebuild and then some uh, protected phasing as of right now, although we are uh, investing in adding uh, a protected intersection at that location. So um, I know you were emailing with Mark earlier today about that. Um, but uh, but we are we are looking into that. Um, I'm just pulling up my crash history. Um, there were three crashes at Spruce and Folsom. Two were severe injuries. Uh, of the seven crashes at Pine and uh, Folsom, three were severe. Uh, there was one severe injury crash on 20th Street north of the 20th and Pine intersection. Um, you know, several severe crashes on 28th. Uh, but in the study area, the severe crashes are mostly on full zone. Okay, thank you. Are there questions for Ryan? Yeah, this is this is Hutch. Uh, Ryan, this this may not be relevant, but I'm, I'm wondering what the parking rules are in this area. So uh, I believe in this area, there is no neighborhood permit parking. Uh, no, that's not correct. There is There are some blocks there are part of an NPP. Aren't they? I believe they're farther west, though, isn't that? They have definitely, uh, I think, on Pine between 21st and 22nd, I believe there's some. Uh, I believe on the south side, I think they're all on pine. I'm not aware of any on spruce. I haven't, I haven't studied it in a little while because I haven't been parking down there for a while, but definitely certain blocks in that area are part of an NPP. Yeah, we didn't uh, we take a closer look at parking because we're not proposing to move anywhere. Right. So. Was that your only question, Coach? Yeah, uh, that, that, that's fine. The, the reason I asked is that I'm, I'm on that road a lot on a bike 
And the most dangerous thing that typically happens is people pulling in and out of parking and not seeing stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay. which we don't really have a way of addressing with any of these mechanisms. <laughs> <laughs> well, if people are traveling more slowly, it may. Yeah, that's true. Slightly help with that. So I had a related question, Ryan, on driver behavior. Um, some of the neighborhood feedback um, talked about motorists not behaving properly, about passing cyclists too close to a roundabout. It's definitely something I experience quite frequently in that area. Um, do any of these treatments, or do you anticipate that any of these treatments would improve that? Do we have any thinking about that, about sort of better educating motorists about what to do and not to do with respect to approaching cyclists near a roundabout? We have been thinking about that. So um, and that's a great question. We, so we currently sign the roundabouts, um, as you are sure are aware, uh, mm -hmm. that you shall not pass a cyclist in the circle, um, or it says yield cyclists in the circle. No, it uh, says, I think it says do not pass. Okay. Um, so we think that the apron should help with like visually narrowing that space so that it feels less comfortable for drivers to do that. We've also been talking about adding the splitter striping um, as something that could potentially help with that as well. And then thinking about how cyclists own the lane before they actually enter the traffic circle, because we can't pull the bike lanes through the circle. And so we've been thinking about the markings uh, as well on the ground. We have not yet landed on a recommendation for that, but that is something that we, we are thinking about. Okay, great. Um, my other question was about um, the treatments that you have labeled as horizontal. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I'm not sure if that means that the treatments themselves are horizontal or that that's a horizontal deflection of drivers, because I thought like curb extensions, are we talking only paint or are we talking actual concrete? Same thing with refuge islands, would it just be painted? Is that what makes them horizontal versus vertical? Can you enlighten me? Yes, so, so we mean horizontal deflection. Okay. Uh, but for, and, and as a clarification for the NSMP, we are thinking in terms of uh, flat work concrete. So not necessarily the paint and post projects we've been doing through the Vision Zero Innovation Program. Okay, thank you. And then my last one was on the right in, right out um, at Fine in 28. Mm -hmm. It looked like you were only thinking of changing that uh, on the, the western leg of the intersection. I'm just curious, would this affect left-hand turns from 28th onto Pine, where there's now a, uh, there's a left turn bay? It would, or would, we would be restricting those movements. We would be restricting them. So we would be pulling the median in the middle of 28th through the intersection. Okay. And so effectively, if you wanted to turn left into this neighborhood, you would do so either at Pearl or at Mapleton, Correct. if you are northbound 28th Street. That's right. Okay, interesting. Um, okay, does anyone have feedback for Ryan now? Alex, go ahead. It says Ryan alluded to earlier, and as most of you know, I've been interested about thinking through what we can do at the intersection of Folsom and Pine. It shows up in our uh, most recent completed Safe Streets Report technical appendix highlighting some of the numerous crashes that impact vulnerable road users. I think the HSIF project is going to address some of the left turning crashes that involve active users of transportation. However, there are some right turning vehicle crashes that will not be solved by that. And so that's where my interest in the seeing what else we can do on the ground to eliminate those right turn crashes. Uh, that's really motivated my desire to see if we can get a protected intersection here. And uh, I reached out to Mark Schisler today. He informed me that the city is looking into various treatments there. They didn't feel like they have anything ready for public consumption yet. I hope that if they're possibly is something it is incorporated into the January engagements and is something that I'll certainly be considering 
when this comes back to tap in March. I've heard some reluctance to include something there, and it is partially because it would slow cars down a lot. And it seems like if we have this right turning vehicle problem that can be solved via a protected intersection and it slows cars approaching that intersection eastbound, then we're we're we can solve both that right turn crash problem and the speeding on pine problem. And so as those various designs for that intersection are considered, I think it's also it'd be also be good to consider the addition of the right in right out at Pine and 28th, because that would also probably lead to some traffic diversion and then our counts at the intersection of Folsom and Pine would be lesser and the operational impacts might not be as as strong but uh, really hoping to see what is available there and and happy to meet between now and um in, in January, if if you have some things that are you can you can show off. Thanks, Alex. Any other feedback for uh, Ryan? Mark, go ahead. Sorry, this is feedback. I I like this all and I'm, I'm glad we're addressing this uh, this in a kind of a, a more cohesive and uh, broader way. I do have a question that I should have asked earlier. When we build a right in right out diverter now, um, the treatment of a right out diverter at uh, Mapleton and Folsom now is kind of like a slip lane. It is not, it, it is gently radius and it, it breeds a, definitely a rolling stop at best onto Folsom. So do we have any data that says that in fact, that is a problem design and regardless, will a future right out diverter have a smaller radius and, um, engender slower turning maneuvers? That's a good question. So the, uh, so the, Ma the Mapleton and Folsom diverter uh, is one where, uh, so, so I agree, it does feel very wide. And actually the, uh, the primary issue that we are hearing from neighborhood residents at that location is that drivers are actually um, taking illegal left turns. So they're, they're turning around the corner of the island to go mm -hmm. to Mapleton. Um, so that's why we are actually considering hard and center lines there is to prevent them from doing that. So um, we haven't quite landed on, should it be a hard and center line along the actual center line or should we do something to extend the nose of the median? Uh, which would, I think, slow down turning traffic to your point, Mark. Um, so that's that's something to consider. For the one we're proposing to build at 28th and Pine, um, certainly we'll take a look at that design for that consideration. But I would say also that it would be really hard to turn fast out of Pine Street um, because you'd have to wait for a breaking traffic anyway. Okay, thank you. And then uh, one thing I did want to note, uh, separate from the Whittier project, is that we did install 100% of uh, the 55th Street Pine Street or the 55th Street Complex project, which was one of the first complex complex projects you prioritized, and then about 90% of the 26th Street one. Okay. Um, any other feedback for Ryan? I don't have a whole lot substantive. Um, I'm also quite pleased to see the variety of treatments here. Um, 
and very pleased to see that it will be a buffered bike lane. Uh, I think that's been long, a long awaited desire of the community and the cycling community on that road. Um, as we've seen on Spruce, um, you know, and we will see in the coming months, um, snow diversion plowing, um, that remains to be an issue. And I think it's more exacerbated by the on-street parking that doesn't go away seasonally or with storm events. Um, but that's you know something to think about in future future waves, I suppose. But uh, I am looking forward to seeing better cycling treatments along this facility, um, and appreciate your ability to do more than just a few speed humps. So thank you. Um, I've heard a lot from people on the 26th Street project since you brought it up, <laughs> um, and in particular, cyclists asking what the heck are these speed bumps doing in the bike lane. Um, it's a little different road geometry there because of course there's no pan and gutter and things um, because there's no uh, sidewalk along that section of roadway. And I've tried to explain to the people that have contacted me that um, mostly we put the speed bumps there because otherwise cars go into the, the bike lane to avoid speed bumps. Um, but there was also some, someone had talked to you at Ryan and, and said maybe the contractor hadn't fully followed the specs. So are there kinks to be ironed out? Is there a better answer for the cyclists who use this other than don't go too fast? <laughs> um, yes. what, what, what's the 10% that's remaining? The medians. Okay. So, so install the two medians at bookend of the speed cushions. Mm -hmm. The Speed cushions were initially installed with ramps that were about half the length of the design. So they, they were, did seem abrupt, yes. <laughs> they were very aggressive. Okay. So we uh, we fixed that uh, two weekends ago. Okay. So, so we lengthened the speed cushions so that they are now uh, much more comfortable to bike or ride over. Um, so you can, yeah, they uh, you can drive over them at about 15 to 20 miles an hour you can bike over them about the same speed. Right. And then you, of course, you know, we expected that more confident cyclists may take the lane and ride through the cutout and that is occurring. Um, mm -hmm. And I think because the street is traffic calm now, that seems to be okay. Yeah, okay. If you're comfortable doing so, you can. All right, good to hear, thank you. No Anything else for Ryan on the NSMP before we move on? Excellent, thank you. We'll move along then. Uh, items five on the agenda, downtown Boulder Station draft a SEEP. We will not be having the, the actual public hearing in SEEP this month that will come up, is it January or February? Soon. Um, but this is just giving us a, a touch point here as uh, we're getting ready for the SEEP on the downtown station um, renovations and street changes. That's also me. Well, hello. <laughs> hello again for uh, the good of the recording. My name is Ryan Knowles. I'm a senior transportation planner here at the city of Boulder. And tonight I am going to give a brief update on the downtown Boulder station gate expansion project. Uh, so just a little bit of background. The uh, project is really intended to increase station capacity. Um, so we did a study uh, that shows that downtown Boulder Station uh, now accommodates more buses and passengers than the, the uh, current design was uh, meant to serve, and that we need more capacity, um, especially as we plan future projects such as the bus rapid transit along the State Highway 119 and uh, State Highway 7 are the Arapahoe Avenue corridor. Um, so this project really was identified uh, in several studies. Uh, one, in, one was the Canyon Bull Boulevard Complete Street Study, um, which looked or called for improvements for uh, mobility uh, around the station and across Canyon in particular. Um, the Downtown Boulder Station Feasibility Study, which limited those capacity limitations and the need for expansion. And then our master plan, which um, identified the downtown station improvements as a near-term action item uh, between 2019 and 2024. Um, and so 
Uh, the primary goals of this project is to increase the comfort and safety for existing riders um, and to meet the uh, guidelines and requirements of the ADA. So uh, currently the existing conditions at the station is that we do have crowding, um, especially um, in the, uh, the regional route uh, section uh, north of Canyon under the parking garage. Uh, so I, I would like to note also that the station serves about the same number of bus lines as uh, Denver's Union Station, but has half the gate capacity. So if you've taken the Flatiron Flyer or the AV1 uh, in that bus bay under the parking garage, you'll notice that it's very congested at times. Um, the uh, inadequate bus gates on Canyon, which we are looking at through a separate project, uh, also add to this issue. Uh, but we do have a uh, example in the successful transit street between Walnut and Canyon as a way to effectively expand the capacity of the station without building an entirely new station. So the concept plan is uh, to extend the uh, transit street to uh, 14th south of Canyon, so between Canyon and Arapaho Avenue. Uh, so this would uh, primarily be for local routes uh, with the regional services staying in the actual um, uh, bus bays at the station that I mentioned a moment ago. Um, so this 14th, 14th Street expansion may include stops for the dash jump 204, 205, 208, 225, for example. Um, and so the purpose of the SEEP, the Community Environmental Assessment Process, is really to refine uh, this proposed concept. Um, so we're looking at providing five additional bus gates, uh, improving sidewalks, including info kiosks, wayfinding, uh, creating uh, some additional urban design and uh, replacing existing landscaping. Uh, and uh, we will also be removing some parking spaces, which is another focal point for the SEEP. Uh, so uh, potentially up to 18 uh, spaces would be affected on 14th Street. Uh, we are also looking at street light, lighting along the corridor, um, again, to improve uh, safety and comfort for riders. So it's just a quick breakdown of the budget for the uh, project. So as you can see, the majority of the funds are federal uh, with RTD also contributing, but the city does have a large share. Um, and the total is just under a million dollars. And as a reminder, the SEEP process uh, is really to assess environmental, social, and fiscal impacts of the project against existing city plans and policies. Uh, so for example, the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan as well as our TMP. And to identify and refine a preferred concept. And so because we have a proposed concept for this project coming out of those studies that I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, we're really uh, assessing the proposed concept and then a no build option. So doing uh, a refined uh, expansion of the transit street or not doing, not doing it. We held our first information session on October 27th. Um, and so uh, things that we heard uh, at that engagement uh, opportunity were that we should ensure the safety of Boulder High School students in the area, uh, given additional bus traffic. And so uh, our concept design will focus on ensuring that Vision Zero principles are applied uh, to the study area, particularly at the intersections of uh, 14th Street and uh, Canyon and Arapaho. Um, we also heard we ought to consider amenities along 14th Street, such as bike parking and lighting. Um, so 
So those are things that we are um, looking into uh, per the city standards. Um, and then uh, extending the White Rock Ditch multi-use path across 14th Street. And so uh, just a note on that, we uh, did recently replace the existing box culvert bridge over the White Rock Ditch uh, connecting 14th and 15th Street. Uh, the bridge lays the groundwork for an extension of the multi-use path further east, which is identified in the TMP. Um, however, there are some private property constraints that may prevent us from doing that in the near future. So that's just something that we're looking into and working through. Um, and then of course, the uh, impacts to parking that I mentioned are a concern for businesses in the area. Also the farmer's market, which is just one block over on 13th street. Next steps for the project. Uh, so we are going to give uh, the city council a briefing on uh, where we are in the process next month. And then uh, in February, we will hold our next community engagement uh, session and then uh, do some further engagement online. We are planning on uh, bringing a uh, recommended, or I should say we're, we are planning on bringing a recommended design uh, to you in April and asking for uh, your recommendation following a public hearing. Um, and so that would be for the SEEP part of this. And then um, should you give us your recommendation, we would go to city council in early summer of next year uh, with uh, their option to call up the project. Uh, should the project move forward from there, then we will uh, begin finalizing the design and working through the approval process in the summer and then working towards a fall 2023 construction. And I'll take any questions you have. And we also have a few people on the line who can take ones that I don't have good answers for. Thanks, Ryan. We'll turn it over to Tab. Any questions? Let's see if I can see you all. So Ryan, you referred to, um, I beat you, Mark. <laughs> Uh, you referred to the successful, um, was it a transit street you said, but it, you know, between, I'm blanking, Walnut. north of Canyon. Yes. Um, yes, and that street is pretty notable because it also restricts vehicle movements. In fact, in that photo, you can see motor vehicles are di diverted, you know, either left or right, buses and bikes get to go on that street. Um, I know you've talked about removing parking um, on the south side of this intersection, but are you also anticipating restricting vehicle movements? Uh, and then as a related question, I'm wondering if there's been thought, I'm sure there has been thought, I'm wondering what the thinking is about the routing of buses. Are they also going to be coming on both directions on 14th Street or will they be primarily coming from Canyon and exiting on Arapaho? Uh, how is this expected to um, impact those nearby streets if we change existing vehicular patterns? Yeah, those are good questions. So the uh, first part of your question, uh, we are not proposing restricting vehicular movements on 14th south of Canyon. And that's uh, due to the fact that there are a number of businesses that will need to use 14th in order to get to their properties. Um, so it would just be very difficult to do that for us. Mm -hmm. uh, for the uh, bus movements, and I know, I believe Danny is on the line, so he can weigh in if I don't say this in its entirety or correctly, um, but we are still working on uh, which routes will be served by the expansion and which will remain at the existing uh, station. And so uh, we are working with RTD on that, but until we know which routes exactly will be there, we're not exactly sure how the approaches will work and how the boardings and alighting will. Danny, do you have anything to add to that? Um, good evening, this is uh, Danny O'Connor, Senior Transportation Planner, Transit Program Manager. Um, really, I, I guess the only thing to add to that is, um, you know, RTD is, is a good and active partner in this project. Um, they're coming out this week um, with some buses to do some turning, um, turning movements and, and different um, operational moves 
to really help inform um, kind of the operation plan and which buses would go where with these expanded gates. So. Okay. Um, I'm I'm partly asking because of the um, the public commentary about wanting to protect the high school students nearby. They are, of course, not that far away at 15th and Arapaho. Um, and so, curious if if uh, putting a protected intersection on the Arapaho end is at all an option, or if that's more difficult if you're expecting high volumes of bus traffic. Uh, I don't know. So uh, this is Garrett Slater, Principal Transportation Hi, Projects Engineer, and I can uh, uh, speak to that item. And so as part of the, um, the bus demonstration testing that we'll be doing this week with RTD, what part of the, uh, the criteria we're going to be evaluating is uh, the ability of the buses to make turns at some of these intersections. Okay. And as we uh, take a look at that, if there are opportunities to improve the, the crossing safety while also allowing uh, full movement of the, the transit vehicles, then certainly we'll, we'll uh, factor that into the design. Uh, some of our preliminary analysis does show that uh, most of the students travel down 13th or 15th and not so much 14th um, due to uh, those uh, being where the, uh, the traffic signals are located and other um, bus routes. But, with the presence of these bus gates uh, coming in on 14th, that would certainly increase the likelihood of high school students um, using 14th as a pedestrian corridor. Right, and of course, they're still on Arapaho at 14th Street, which is why I was sort of highlighting that intersection. Um, but it sounds like it doesn't necessarily, that, that the fact that they are bus vehicles doesn't necessarily uh, preclude something like a protected intersection or raised intersection or the like, if that were deemed necessary. Right, at, at this point, uh, those options would still be on the table for consideration. Okay. Any other questions, feedback from TAB? Mark, Maybe. go ahead. Yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm scrolling through. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, my uh, questions are in regard to the uh, pedestrian crossing at 14th and Canyon. So are the mast arms and signalization infrastructure there adequate? Should we want to implement uh, a protected intersection, protected left-hand turns, et cetera, or do we have a situation like we have at um, Baseline and Mohawk where we, we can't implement some things because the infrastructure is inadequate? So we haven't looked at the intersection for uh, at 14th and Canyon for, for protected elements, Mark. And so uh, that would be, I guess, as, as we take a look at the operation needs of the, the bus vehicles, then uh, we, we can factor in those types of questions as well. Is what, what I'm really concerned about is a scenario, someone uh, from out of town gets dropped off at on Walnut at, this, at the, uh, the north side of the, of the Walnut Street Station, and they're trying to catch a bus to the airport, or, and I, I, you know, the AB will probably be under the shelter, but, but suddenly they realize, oh my God, I've got to cross Canyon, and I've got to go on 14th Street a block, a block, block and a half away to catch my bus. And um, uh, so, I'm concerned about pedestrians being in a rush, trying to catch a bus and the um, signalization uh, being inadequate for pedestrians crossing. Um, so I think that's something that we should look at. And, and so as we have this pool of money to make these improvements, and I know it's, it's not unlimited, but I would certainly wouldn't wanna be caught off guard for the signalization aspects of 14th and Canyon. The, um, the other thing I have is a question that if you wanted to, 
Um, I'm sure there's a technical term for this and there's a, uh, uh, a dancing uh, square dance acronym where you turn all lights red and you have pedestrians crossing in all directions, including diagonally all at once. So um, like we do in, as our, in our earlier discussion at Pine and 20th next to Whittier Elementary, if you're a pedestrian and you hit that button, you are offered a, an intersection where, again, the square dance term or whatever it is for that, uh, that particular condition allows for everyone to cross all at once, any direction. Um, would our current infrastructure allow for that kind of uh, pedestrian accommodation? I don't know the answer to that question, Mark. I don't know if anyone from operations that's on the call is able to speak to that. I, I can say that one factor that uh, we would definitely need to consider is if we had an all stop, what would that do to the queuing in the westbound direction of Canyon and how that would affect uh, buses uh, being able to get in and out of the, the station and how that might affect um, departure and arrival times if, if we've got uh, queuing during peak periods. But I don't know if anyone from operations is uh, uh, present to be able to speak to that. Hi, good evening. Uh, this is Devin Joslin, Principal Traffic Engineer for the city. Unfortunately, Mark, I don't know the answer to your question either at this time, and, and that is something we can check into. Thank you. Mark, it's called a barn stands. Yes. <laughs> that's, that's what I was looking that's for. That's the is one. There, is there a technical name for that? Can it all stop? Is that the? For all pen phase. Okay. Thank you. All right, Tab, any other questions for Ryan? Yeah, I was just wondering if there's any mechanism as you guys examine the operational details of this for thinking about the twice a week times when the farmer's market is going on a week away and there's people in cars all over the place going to the farmer's market. Let me be clear, I really like this idea. So this isn't meant to be a negative, it's just like, hmm. There's something to potentially integrate with. Okay. Ely, you mentioned some sort of protections at Arapaho and 14th. Can you say a little bit more what you meant by that? Is that for me, Alex? Uh, Teal, I think, mentioned Arapaho and 14th. And I was have Mark has talked about protected signal phasing at Canyon and 14th. I was curious what Tila was getting at at Arapaho and 14th. Yeah, there. just a protected treatment there. I of any whatever. I I don't want to dictate to staff what the you know what the mechanism is, but I'm aware it's not signalized. Um, and so what would we do there to protect pedestrians? You know, assuming that there's bigger bus traffic, less nimble bus traffic, and still you know, at least for a good chunk of the year, some fairly erratic students in the area. Okay. Okay, so I see no other questions, feedback for Ryan on this topic. Looks like uh, we can move along then. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, we, uh, we're now at Matters. Matters from staff, non-agenda, item one under here, utility project related closure of baseline. Okay, excellent. Um, so we, we have some folks here um, from the utilities side of the house to talk about a utilities project that will have significant impacts on um, baseline. So with that, I will um, turn it over to Joe Tadeucci. Thank you, Erica, and good evening, TAB members. My name is uh, Joe Tadeucci. I am the director of our utilities department, and I am here tonight with Chris Olson. Chris is a senior project manager in our utilities engineering work group. And we wanted to brief you on our baseline and foothill sewer project in advance of construction that will be starting in the new year. And Chris will be 
going through a few slides with you, but uh, just briefly here from me, this is a project that will increase the capacity of our wastewater collection system. And one of the primary and long-term benefits of that to our community is that it will alleviate the potential for sewer backups during precipitation events like happened um, during the 2013 flood. We're doing a number of these capacity projects. The project will also have some temporary transportation impacts, which uh, Chris will discuss. And so we wanted to check in with you tonight in advance of the work um, in case you get questions from community members or to answer your questions that you might have here tonight. And then recognizing that there has been significant staff transition in both our transportation and mobility and utilities departments since the design has started just for Chris and, and me to introduce ourselves. So you will have a connection uh, and you can point people to us if you do get questions. So with that, I will turn it over to Chris Olson. Chris. Thanks, Joe. Um, just for my own clarity, can everybody see the, the PowerPoint screen that, that popped up? Just a thumbs up would be, no? No, not yet, Chris. Not yet. What did I do wrong? I'd be sharing a different screen. So it says one participant can share at a time. I'll try it again. All right, we can see it now. Okay, good. All righty, thanks, Joe. Um, yeah, we'll, I'll touch very, very briefly on, on some of the planning and, and drivers for the project and what the project is. Um, and then we'll kind of get into some of the, the traffic impacts and detours that are planned and, and sort of what it, outreach activities have happened to date and what's planned to, to move forward. So very briefly, as Joe touched on during, during heavy precipitation events, um, we, we get a substantial amount of, um, of rainwater that enters our wastewater collection system. And we have a certain level of service goals for how much of, you know, what level of storm we wanna be able to handle. And on this figure here, this is a, this is a, a model that, that illustrates certain areas of our collection system that have limited capacity during some of those more severe rainfall events. So these areas that are, that are noted in red and orange tend to be a little bit more capacity limited and, and have greater risk uh, to our customers of, of sanitary sewer backups or overflows into the, into the environment. So we really work to try and minimize those. Um, so that's a, uh, that's a simulation that's done. It's a, it's a computer program that's you know, it's based on you know, all the geometry of our system. But we also look at, from a practical standpoint, where we have seen um, sanitary sewer backups or overflows um, in, in historic times. So this figure was, was developed after the 2013 flood. And any note in, or any, any of these nodes that are either in, in orange or blue, uh, were a backup into somebody's, somebody's home or business um, during the 2013 flood. The area that we're looking at improving the service to is this area that's highlighted in red here in this area. So generally that area is bound, it's on the south side where, where this, you know, this off ramp here is, is the intersection of 36 and South Boulder Road. Um, this, this service area is, is this area that kind of, um, it's, you know, on the south side, it's, it's bound by 36 here. Um, Foothills Parkway intersects it down the middle and it runs this whole service area sort of runs all the way out to South Boulder Creek where our interceptor pipeline runs. Um, and so, and then on the north side, the service area is Baseline Road right here. So two, you know, we're really improving the service to this whole area that's illustrated in this kind of, this kind of yellowish tan color here. Um, but I'll note a couple of things on sort of the interior subbasin areas. Um, these two spots in blue and red here that I'm circling, um, they're currently served by a single 10 inch line that runs down underneath the median of foothills right now. And, and that line as a, you know, to serve this area really needs to be a 15 inch line and it's currently a 10. Um, so, you know, one might, one might think, oh, great, we're going to have to dig up foothills to, um, to address this. Well, no, there's, there's actually 
a good opportunity along Thunderbird Road and Thunderbird Court that's just on the west side of that. Um, so we're actually going to install a parallel pipeline that's going to convey all the flow from this red area um, up to an existing crossing, and then we'll tie in here. And then this, this line currently ties into a line that runs from west to east uh, down, the, down the existing baseline corridor, and there are also limitations on how much this line can flow. Um, so this, this line gets in, the size increased and installed at a steeper slope. So we're able to convey additional capacity from really this entire, this entire sub-basin in the city here. So essentially there's a, um, we start near just, just west of the Bobo Link Trailhead on some open space Mountain Parks property. Um, from there, we're along the baseline right away, west almost all the way to Foothills. And then down, uh, this is a small little drainage on the south side of baseline and the north side of, of foothills here. And then we pick it up again on the west side of the road. And this is in front of the, or on the, on the east side of the Safeway Shopping Center here, the Colorado Athletic Club and Fraser Meadows. And this is an existing pedestrian bridge crossing um, that goes up and over foothills. And then we're about a block south of that. Unfortunately, uh, given the geometry of, of baseline and existing utilities that are in the area, there's no right way to really construct this, this project without interrupting traffic in, in baseline. Um, there, we're bound by, by neighborhoods to the north in this area um, and, and to the south, um, both you know, city, city of Boulder um, residents and Boulder County residents live in this area. Um, and really, we're, we're a pretty deep sewer line here. We're, we're in the 10 to 15 foot deep range. And east of 55th, baseline is, is bi-directional. So there's you know, one eastbound and one westbound lane. And there's really no way to, to get equipment in and shoehorn it between, uh, between properties and getting in and, and doing it safely with, with travel. You know, even to be able to keep one lane open would be, would be pretty dangerous. Um, so that essentially means there will be a, a sustained closure of Baseline Road um, from west of Gapter Road, which is which is right here. Um, the Bobo Link Trailhead is is right about at this this logo right here. So there will still be access to the Bobo Link Trailhead throughout the entirety of the construction, um, and it will be closed from this this point to 55th um, to everyone except for local and emergency access. So folks may need to get to their home and police and fire may need to get to residences from one side of the project area or the other side of the project area. So it would essentially turn this stretch of baseline into a dead end road for those residents. Um, phase two is some intersection phasing work. Um, phase three is the next, the next phase. Um, at, that, at 55th, baseline transitions from being two lanes on the east side to being four lanes that's divided by a median on, on the west side. So we're able to uh, divert traffic onto the north. So the, it, the current westbound lanes um, will, will transition to serve both eastbound and westbound. And the project area will be in the south side. Um, so the current eastbound lanes. Um, from there, there's a little bit of work. This is, um, this is some seed out right away that will be right up, right up against. Um, but we don't anticipate having significant impacts for any, any sustained period of time in this area. Um, and then once we make a tie-in on the west side, this is near a uh, multi-use path that runs on the east side of that Safeway Shopping Center. Um, we'll be running south down, uh, <clears throat> down the path corridor onto Thunderbird Court, down to Thunderbird Drive, and then uh, making final tie-ins south of uh, near Ricara. So we'll be able to maintain access to, to everybody within the closure area, um, with the exception of a, a few small, um, you know, we may be in front of somebody's driveway for an afternoon, and we'll just be coordinating directly with those residents at that time when that, when that happens. Um, but essentially, we'll be able to maintain access for, for both residents and, and emergency vehicles through the area. Um, so with closures come detours, 
Um, I didn't, I, I kind of, I kind of summarized the, the major detour because um, I didn't want to pull up 10 pages of, of MHTs at, um, for tab, but just generally the intent is for the primary detour to intersect or to intercept traffic on baseline at 76th and divert them down to South Boulder Road up to Foothills and then back. Um, so that would, that would catch, um, you know, some of the major commuter traffic that comes into town from, from the east and leaving from, uh, from the west, but it's not going to catch everyone. There, there are certainly neighborhoods and things, so there's sort of a secondary detour um, right at the, at the work area, and that would go up and up or down 55th to Arapahoe and then down Cherryvale at that point. Um, bicycle detour is up 55th um, and then to the Centennial Trail. And that ties into the South Boulder Creek Trail and back down to the Bobo Link Trailhead at this point here. Um, we've done a, a significant amount of, of outreach to try and inform uh, folks of, of the upcoming project um, starting in May this year. Uh, it's been a large variety of, uh, of mailers um, and then personally reaching out to, to certain stakeholders, uh, folks like RTD, uh, Boulder Valley Schools, um, police and fire. Um, there's, there's one daycare center that's within the closure area. So coordinating with them and making sure that we're not impacting them at times that parents are dropping off kids that, um, and that we're you know, addressing, addressing their needs. Um, additionally, there, you know, just generally in the project area, there are a number of businesses. There's the athletic club. There's Fraser Meadows that both have access near, near the area. There, there's Second Baptist Church and the Islamic Center are also in the area. So reaching out to those to those teams and those guys. Um, <clears throat> I've also been following up with um, um, targeted mailers and next door posts. Um, next door posts are, are slated to, to be coming out, you know, a little bit closer to the, to the timing. If, if you get ahead of people a little bit, a little bit too soon, um, they tend to forget about it. Um, so that'll be about the same time that variable message boards go up in, in this area. Um, and then as we go through the prod, you know, the actual construction of the project, we'll be maintaining, um, the, the, the city cone zone sites, um, as well as similar next door posts and, um, variable message signage, and, and we have set up a bi-weekly meeting with certain transportation stakeholders to keep them informed of, of progress. Um, so, you know, getting RTD and, and the school district and things in, in the same room and trying to make sure that they're informed on, on what's going on with the project. So that was a pretty high level project summary. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to, to transportation staff for any follow-up from, from their team. I think Natalie, you might have a couple words. Yeah, say. sorry, sorry about that. I was working on my mute button. Um, thanks, Chris. And yeah, I just wanted to add, just so that Tab's aware, we will be coming. We have this um, corridor planned for pavement resurfacing in 2024-ish timeframe. That's obviously tentative, but um, we'll be coming back. We're planning in 2024. Um, and at that time is when will be as we you know prepare for the improvements in 2024 we'll be looking at what type of enhancements we can make through the vision zero program um similar you know to what we've done on other corridors to date and that's Thanks, all I yeah is that for both east and west of foothills on baseline it so i was thinking specifically of east of foothills um, mm -hmm. Garrett, Garrett may be able to provide the timing for west of foothills. Or we can get back to you with that if he doesn't have it offhand. Uh, yes, I don't have the answer to that offhand, Alex. I know that the, the plan was focused primarily east of foothills, but uh, I, I will follow up and see uh, if we have a timeline uh, identified for baseline west. Okay, West looks like it's not on the 2022 PMP map. Is that safe to assume that that's true and it'll be 2023 at the earliest? That's correct. Okay, thank you. Okay, that's all I other have. Thanks, Chris. Yep. Other questions from Tab? 
Keila, can I? Yes, I see you, Ryan. There you are. <laughs> Chris, thanks a lot. Uh, question: I heard you. I heard some discussion on on someone re re referencing multi-use paths, and I was trying to follow. Can you just say directly um, where, if at all, will multi-use paths where will where you know people who would be traveling maybe with small kids or elderly or whatever who are really going to be um, sensitive to diversions onto higher stress areas. Where, where will they be affected? If they... Um, so the only the only multi-use path that's affected is is from uh, Thunderbird Court north up to Baseline, and and we still we're still sort of sorting out what the um, what the official detour would be for that. Um, so I would I'm not going to defer to anyone in in transportation at this moment to to try and clarify, but it is. On our on our projects, we we try not to forget about the bike path. You know the, those types of paths. It's it's an important mode of transit for the city, and and we definitely have a requirement to to take care of those users. Thank you. Thanks for that, Ryan. Anyone else? I'm scrolling through. All right. Joe, Chris, thank you very much. That looks thank like you. all we have. Thank you. Okay. Next, Dr. Cog, update. Hi, good evening, Tab. Um, my name is Jean Sanson. I am a principal transportation planner with the city, and thanks for having me this evening. So. This evening's regional update is going to be a briefing about the upcoming Dr. Cog TIP or Transportation Improvement Program call for projects. And I'm gonna share my screen. So give me just one second. Let's see. All right, are you guys seeing a slide? Okay, awesome. Wonderful. So just a reminder. So the last time we went through this cycle um, where we identified projects to bring forward for um, transportation improvement program dollars was back in 2018 for in 19 for the 2022-2023 cycle. And this list just gives you a sense of the types of projects that have been or are being funded through um, a variety of sources and, and part of the Dr. Cog tip. So for example, the 28th Street Bat Lanes was a regional tip application that we submitted with Boulder County and the city of Longmont uh, to complete um, our northern section of 28th Street, which is in final design now, um, along with improvements that are being made on the trunk of the diagonal or 119 uh, between Boulder and Longmont. And then Longmont is putting dollars into improving Kaufman Street um, as part of the regional BRT project um, at the north end of that corridor. So again, just an example of a larger scale TIP project. Um, and then the, the projects that are listed down below are our sub-regional TIP projects. So you heard from Ryan earlier this evening about the status of the downtown Boulder Station. Um, we also mentioned the Easter Arapaho Multi-Use Path and Transit Enhancements Project, which um, the SEEP was just approved by you all. Um, the Hop Transit Service Expansion Project, which was rescoped um, to purchase electric vehicles for our Hop Fleet. And um, at one time, there was a proposal for a Table Mesa multi-use path and access improvement TIP project. Um, those funds are now um, being directed towards improvements to 30th Street between Colorado and, Arapa and um, Arapaho for raised um, bicycle lanes. Um, and then I just want to mention the State Highway 7 bridge replacement um, TIP project. So that is a project along Arapaho, um, and it is replacing the, well, there are two bridge spans over Boulder Creek. And so this project is currently on the wait list. Um, it's not looking very likely that we will be able to accept wait list dollars because the restrictions that are coming with the dollars for that project. And um, there are a very small percentage of the dollars that we would need to complete that project, but we're coordinating closely with CDOT Region 4 to um, find other sources of dollars to replace that bridge. So an example of just how we leverage our local funds with state and federal dollars to um, 
to bring forward these important local and regional um, projects that improve travel for all modes of transportation. So with the upcoming um, TIP schedule, and I don't expect you to read the details of this, but what I wanted to do tonight was just give you a preview of what we're thinking this next cycle of, or call for projects is going to look like. And I should note that this schedule is still in draft form. So again, I just wanna make sure we all understand what the schedule will likely look like, but it's something that the board is going, Dr. Cog board is going to take action on this month. So, so um, if they do take action and approve this schedule, uh, Dr. Cog will be opening up a, a call for projects for regional projects um, in January, in late January. And we've been in conversations with Boulder County and our regional partners about bringing forward projects along Colorado 119, the diagonal, as well as Colorado 7, two of our higher priority um, NAMS corridor projects. And then you'll notice that the first sub-regional call is going to open most likely in May of this year and close in 2022. Then there'll be another regional call for projects in October of this year and another sub-regional call um, in early 2023. And I'm not going to get into the details of why they're doing um, this two-track process this year, um, except to say that with um, the influx of ARPA or federal stimulus funds, as well as state um, new state transportation dollars, um, it just works out that it makes more sense to bring these forward in two different tracks. And so what I want to focus on just for a minute is this first sub-regional call for projects. So um, what this means is that we have between now, essentially, um, and May to start thinking about what the candidate projects are that we would move forward with. And I will say that at this point in time, it seems to us to make sense that we would also identify that identify projects for that second call as well. So as not to make this a two-step process for ourselves at the city, but be prepared to submit candidate projects for both the first and second sub-regional calls. So I'm just gonna spend um, a quick minute looking at what that application process has looked like and will likely uh, look like moving forward. Um, so we start by identifying candidate TIP projects. We develop very high level concept designs and cost estimates. We take that out to our community members um, and to Dr. Cog for feedback and then bring those projects to TAB for your endorsement before it goes to city council and, we're, and we submit those projects um, as candidate projects for um, our applications. And I wanna focus on that, that first square, which is to identify candidate TIP projects. So again, I wanted to mention that I'm bringing this early because there's work for us to do even to get to that first box, if you will. So um, as a staff, we're going to be working to identify what our, I would say, theme or policy approach to putting projects forward will be. So for example, are we looking at regional connections? Is it more of a corridor approach? Should we also be considering our low stress walk and bike network? What is the status of studies for projects that are part of the TMP and what is their project readiness? And then what types of projects might be more appropriate for other types of grant applications or set asides? So we're not sure what that's gonna look like. It would be great to get feedback from TAB this evening. Um, but we are going to be working diligently to identify what that process looks like to bring those projects um, to that first stage, and we'll be updating you along the way. Um, so thank you. Let's see. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, that's all I had, and I'm happy to answer questions. And I've got Garrett here, which is great because he's actually been was closely involved in the last process and I'm still getting my arms around what this is looking like, but happy to answer questions. So thank you. So Jean, if I'm understanding you correctly, you're looking tonight for feedback from TAB about how basically how we should be prioritizing among sort of a, an existing wish list of potential tip projects. Well. Yeah, you know, Tila, it might be nice to, to start brainstorming that or to follow up after this evening's meeting because this is all very new information. Um, mm -hmm. And really the point of this evening's briefing was just, just to let you know that this is coming. Okay. Thanks, now we know it's coming. What's coming? <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, and well, like I said, you know, the, what's coming first is we're going to be bringing to tab what our proposed approach is to identifying okay. candidate projects. And you're still figuring out what that what that proposed approach is. We are still figuring that out. And, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, based on a lot of the work that we've done, you know, over the past past year or two, you know, we want to be more systematic about it um, this time around. So. Um, we're, you know, we're, we're really focusing on a more of a standardized approach to putting these projects forward. And, you know, another consideration is looking at um, the scoring criteria for these projects. So again, like what is going to make a good candidate project, what's going to score well. So those are the types of factors we'll be considering. And do we know what that scoring criteria looks like? Because it's that's been changing over the course of the last couple of years. Yeah, it has been changing. Um, we have a pretty good sense of what, well, we have a pretty good sense of what it looks like for the regional TIP application. So in other words, um, the draft application right now waits, I'm gonna stop sharing for a second because I'm gonna pull up this information. I don't wanna misspeak. Um, so let's see, right now, the regional TIP application is um, scoring regional impact of the proposed project at, um, 30% of the weighting, and then 50% um, is weighted towards Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan priorities, and there are six of those priorities. So they include safety, air quality, regional transit, active transportation, freight, and multimodal mobility. So that is 50%. Project readiness um, accounts for 10%. And um, Oh, I'm missing one. So yeah, project leveraging accounts for 10%. So in other words, how much match is the local entity putting forward? So that's what we so that's what we're seeing for the draft regional application at this point. Again, it hasn't been approved. We expect the sub-regional application to look very similar to this, but it, it's up to our sub-region, Dr. Cog, Boulder County sub-regional forum to identify exactly what that criteria looks like for the sub-region. So for example, um, where the region's looking at um, regional impacts, we might be looking at sub-regional impacts or intercity travel. Okay, Erica, I see your hand up. I guess just contextually, you know, we're sharing with um, this with you early in the process. And as we know it, you know, there's clearly fluidity involved. Um, but this is part of the kind of sausage making, if you will, when it comes to transportation funding and getting a, um, you know, a, one or more projects funded within this regional process. And so that's really the intent, you know, today of just trying to share that with you and give you kind of a peek behind the curtain of um, essentially how a project comes to be from a funding standpoint. Okay, thanks for that, Alex. Yeah, thanks for presenting on this, Gene. It's exciting to be a part of this process from the beginning. I've mostly been reacting to mm -hmm. projects that were well before my time. So it's cool to, to be on the front end of this. I'm curious how shovel ready things need to be or how much analysis the city feels we need to do before we're comfortable going after something. So for example, we've got this these fabulous multimodal improvements coming in on 30th Street that'll get us from Colorado up to Arapahoe. And then we've got a study that gets us from Arapahoe close to Pearl. If we wanted to continue that sort of improvement north of Pearl, would we be able to rely on that corridor study? Or do we need to hit the ground running on a corridor study so that we could have a conceptual design that we could then look up what the the costs might be and, and get community feedback and tab and council buy-in in advance of submitting the application for a project like that so i i would defer to to garrett to speak specifically to a project like that but i would okay. say you know what dr cog is looking for when they're speaking about project readiness is they want to avoid the pitfalls of you haven't gone through environmental clearance or there might be you might get tripped up in environmental clearance and or there might be issues with right-of-way acquisition and that sort of thing so you want to do enough to feel confident in moving it forward um, but again, I would speak to, I would ask Garrett to kind of speak to that level of readiness for a specific corridor project like the one you mentioned, Alex. Yeah, so I would say that uh, 
the, the plan that we have in place for 30th Street between Arapaho and Pearl is certainly um, a, better than nothing, but I would imagine to score the highest points possible in that category, they'd be looking for something a little bit more engineering oriented and a little less uh, planning centric in terms of its content. And, and so they're, they're, the, the highest points possible would be that we have a set of final construction plans and we just need to get CDOT uh, approvals on all the, the different aspects and permits that are required. But uh, we don't have the time or the, the budget to, for that. So I would say if we wanted to position a project uh, of, of that sort and in that segment, that we would need to advance some design work to have uh, a, a cost estimate that uh, is a little bit more um, um, based on actual quantities on the ground and a little less planimetric oriented. So uh, I, I would say that uh, uh, we, we could spend some effort to score better points to uh, to, to position the project for, for, for better uh, award opportunities. Okay, that's helpful and, to hear. And we would, need to go, we would need to review that on each of the projects that are being considered, right? Um, uh, what level of readiness we feel we are versus where we think we need to be in order to make them as successful as possible for consideration of award. What are some examples of places where we've done some of that preliminary design work and might be able to, in a year's time, be able to submit some convincing plans? I know we've studied Canyon, we've got 119 and Highway 7, are there any other places where we've we've done some of the groundwork and are would be well situated? Right. So, so uh, the the corridor studies that we've got in place, as you noted, and and as also the the Colorado corridor would be another place that we've done some some study that uh, that we could um, take a look at. And I would also say that there there are other um, project locations where we have previously done design work in the hope that a project might be considered for a TIP award and uh, that work is still good work. It would still, uh, but it would need to be uh, sort of dusted off. An example of that would be, um, we have a multi-use path that runs parallel to 28th Street or, or Highway 36 from uh, basically the south edge of the city up to uh, Four Mile Canyon Creek. And uh, we have uh, a, a, an actual final design ready to go to complete that multi-use path all the way up to the connection with Broadway but uh, it's been unsuccessful twice in prior applications based off the criteria. Depending on the, the shape, the criteria comes out with this next call, that might be another example uh, of a, a project that could be considered, right? Okay, thanks. But so if a TAB or council wants something that we don't have on the books, is there would there be time to, if it was a priority and, and fit into the work plan next year, do you think there'd be time to turn that around and early enough that it could be successful? So uh, fortunately, I'm not directly underneath the table from Erica and Natalie, so they can't kick me with my response here. Uh, I'll say uh, I would have um, uh, some concerns about our ability to jump on an, an effort based off our current staffing levels. Um, but if uh, you all as our, our, our advisory board says it's a priority, then um, that would be something that um, Natalie and Erica would need to, to, uh, to help uh, and prioritize amongst all the other items that we've got in the work plan. Okay, I appreciate the transparency on that. Just for clarification's sake, neither Natalie nor I kick anyone under the table <laughs> or even over the table, but I guess what I'd like to highlight, you know, in this conversation, in this process is that it takes a fair amount of getting ready in order to be able to go up and ask for money. And so I know that um, I've heard from TAB members in the past, you know, being frustrated about um, having corridor studies and so forth. And then, you know, the amount of process that we have to go through, but in order to be competitive um, in this uh, regional and state funding arena, um, the more information we have in order to be competitive with other jurisdictions and other projects, the better off we are. So having that you know, clarity and these different layers of the onion, um, it makes us more nimble whenever the opportunity for funding arises because it usually comes and goes pretty quickly, you know, as um, Jean had said in the schedule. But then, um, you know, 
Alex's point about, well, if there were to be a project, you know, how nimble can we be in actually achieving it? Um, you know, it's one of these bigger than a bigger than a bread box, smaller than an elephant kind of things. And so we'd have to figure out what we have to be able to dust off to hurry up and scurry to make it, um, I don't know, if not shovel ready, at least spoon ready. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Natalie, you have your hand up or maybe it's still- Yeah, I was, I was just gonna add. And so, so I think just to kind of round out the conversation, I think we're planning to come back potentially in January if we have more information about the process at that point from Dr. Cog. And so I think it'll be helpful because at that point we will have had a chance to have some internal conversations about, um, you know, our own kind of, how are we, what's the policy driving our priorities? Um, and then also kind of looking at, as, as Garrett mentioned, you know, past efforts to um, get funds. And so we can look at what's kind of on the shelf that we could potentially dust off and we can bring some options forward, um, you know, potentially January, February to tab. And, and that might just kind of help guide the discussion a little bit more. Um, Dean, I don't know if you have anything to add to that as far as just like process for next steps. No, I think that's right. And it might just be categories of projects um, in January as we start to dig a little bit more into um, project readiness. And, and I know we say dust off, but you know, frankly, we have a lot of very relevant and timely corridor projects and design work um, that we feel pretty optimistic about moving forward as potential candidate projects too. So maybe not that dusty. <laughs> so in listening to this, you know, process and how much goes into the scoring and, and just the, the length of time that it takes to to, to realize anything um, out, of, out of these wish lists. It's a little discouraging when I, you know, want, I want to see things that will often require um, coordination from other cities, other agencies, it, and it's, it's mysterious to me advancing um, but there's this long met need for uh, a bikeway like what we have on US 36 between here and Denver uh, to have the same thing between here and Lyons and that there, there seems to be just absolutely no hope of, of ever achieving that. And so I'm, I'm just very confused about how, how we even get to a, a stage where we're, we're proceeding with real bikeway plans along the diagonal to between here and Longmont and what, what you know, the average person who wants to see uh, a correction and a, and a change in direction um, toward more vulnerable road users in a real distinct way um, that is different from how we've been thinking about things for the last 20 years, because the stuff that's on the shelf is still sort of reflecting um, some misallocation, uh, I would say, of prior public priorities and public funding. And I don't know how we, how we turn that around. And I think the second thing that I would say on this process is uh, we'll, we'll get to it when we start talking about um, our letter to city council for their retreat. Um, but, you know, TAB's done a fair bit of navel gazing in the last couple of months. You know, how do we actually help staff and help this city realize the goals that we've said are our community goals in the TMP? And the biggest lever that we could think of uh, the biggest sort of litmus test was reduce, you know, motor vehicle miles traveled, because um, that's going to push us along uh, the right direction, or at least lean us in the better direction than we've been leaning for the last 10 years. And so uh, if I could offer at this stage, just one, you know, one big lens that TAB's going to be applying to this probably when we do come back and discuss this is how does it measure up to and how does it serve our um, larger goals in the TMP. And when we've picked, you know, reduced VMT as the, the big litmus test um, that we want council to turn to, we'll probably ask you to do the same thing unless you got a good answer for, for prioritizing something else. But that's going to be sort of the flavor that we are going to be um, hoping to add to the soup, I guess. I think that's that's really good feedback and direction, Tila. And I would say very consistent with the conversations that we are having with our regional partners about putting forward regional tip applications. For example, for one, the 119 diagonal between 
Boulder and Longmont. So we're doing a lot of internal work to look at what the most viable project would be knowing we can't fund the entire project, but also knowing that, for example, when we're looking at improvements at nodes at key intersections, for example, that when we're putting in transit slip lanes that we're also putting in the underpasses needed for the bike lane because we want to touch a project once right we want we don't want to go back. In. So we're getting really strategic and creative about how to stop siloing even CDOT projects um, between you know, roadway transit and bicycle projects, but to look at it comprehensively. And I think you're gonna see that reflected particularly in the regional applications that we're putting together. Great, thank you. Tab, anything else on this? All right, thanks Jean. Thanks, thanks very much. Yeah. Neighborhood Green Streets update is next, DK. Oh, five slides, well done. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see, it should be working now. Yep, Good we evening, see Tab. Okay, great. You're not seeing the little red box that says give subtitles a try, are you? We are, we are. That is bizarre. Um, okay, <laughs> well, maybe I want to get past that. It'll go away, but, um, hi, I'm, you know, me, I'm DK and senior transportation planner and great to be back with you. Happy holidays tab and have a brief presentation for you tonight. Actually consider this a two-parter because we're going to be back in February to, with uh, a little bit more detail. Um, but tonight we're going to give you, um, a, a brief update on kind of where we're, where we've been and, and where we're going. And um, also uh, the presentation I'm sharing with you tonight is a, oh, that's okay. Um, is a, um, I'm sorry, I'm trying to get this off here. For some reason it's not working. Excuse me one second here. I have a little technical difficulty. Is that working a little better for folks? Okay. Great. Okay, good. And so um, the presentation I'm sharing with you tonight is a slightly modified version from the one that was in your packet. We made some refinements to it. So I wanted to um, put a shout out for that. All right. So let's go ahead and take a look at progress to date. Um, you know, essentially we've been working on this micro network um, for some of our high priority neighborhood green streets. And again, for those that are not familiar, neighborhood green streets are one of the facility types that are in our low stress walk a bike network plan. Um, the other two being bike lanes, preferably buffered, and then also the vertical separated, um, the vertically separated uh, facilities like multi-use paths and uh, protected bike lanes. And so for the past uh, two and a half years now, we've been working on our neighborhood green streets. And it was in 2019 when we incorporated the low stress walk and bike network plan into the TMP work and and our first project we went to town on was uh the 13th street and that was our first trial run at putting in our first neighborhood green street and we did that between 2019 and 20 and then uh last year and part of this year we finished up with uh grove and 23rd street and currently we are studying and we'll be working to implement early next year 19th street 22nd and mapleton streets And so for tonight, I just wanted to share what those focus streets are and a few key points of interest. Um, so 19th has a number of different intersections here that we're gonna be focusing on, um, pretty straightforward. Fortunately, there's a lot, of, a lot of the intersections already have facilitated crossings, that is they're signalized, um, but there is some, um, some work that we'll be doing um, in conjunction with some other projects that are happening. And for example, at uh, 19th and Walnut, there is a development occurring there at the old September school. They're putting a new multi-use path. And so essentially what we're trying to do here is create a, um, a direct line that'll access uh, CU and the CU campus. Uh, where 19th ends on the south part is uh, where the new bridge um, currently is and goes into uh, to CU. And um, I should also mention too, the, the red lines on the map here, those are Grove and 23rd. So those were um, uh, implemented last year and earlier this year, but I included those in the presentation to help you understand how, we're, how we've been working on this micro network. 
And, uh, and then taking a look at um, 22nd here, we have some uh, overlap with our uh, pavement management program. And, uh, and so 22nd will be resurfaced in 2022. And the intersection at Arapaho and 22nd is a challenging intersection. So we're doing a study right now to determine what that best crossing will be. And we come back in February, we'll have more information. And, and uh, speaking of cross-pollination with other programs and projects, um, Ryan mentioned early, earlier uh, about a lot of the um, NSMP work that he's doing in this area as well. And so we are coordinating on Mapleton Street. And of course, we highlighted the intersection of Mapleton and 23rd, uh, we'll, we'll be installing um, a high visibility crosswalk. And so for um, in 2022, we'll be back with you um, at your next tab, at the February tab meeting. Uh, we're gonna take a look at the data collection and the results of that data collection, the community engagement we've done. Uh, we're going to take a look at some of the conceptual designs that we have for those intersections. We're going to talk about our implementation timeline. And then we're also going to uh, discuss what some of the uh, proposed focus streets will be for the next round of neighborhood green streets. And um, it, starting next year and, th and through 2023, also we'll have the opportunity to look at our low stress walk and bike network plan update um, as part of the overall transportation master, up master plan update. So we're looking forward to that. Uh, so with that, I know that was really quick, but uh, just a quick high level for you. And thank you for your time. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thanks, DK. Questions, anyone? Let me cycle through. It's hard for me to see DK with you sharing the screen. Okay, let me... Uh, <laughs> Sorry, I'm a little <laughs> behind. That's helpful. Thank you. Any uh, Any questions? Oh, we're letting you off easy. I guess that was all crystal clear. Pretty straightforward. Okay, Pretty well, we'll be back forward. with a lot more information. So just mm -hmm. wanted to give you the highlights real, kind of where we've been and where we're going. Okay, I think I'm curious about, um, you know, we're always trying to evaluate how we're doing. Um, what's, what kind of data do we have to evaluate the first Green Street, the 13th Street? Are, it's we, a good are we counting number of people on there? Are we, how, what, what are we thinking? That's a good question. And uh, let me get back to you on, on okay. that kind of more comprehensive answer. Okay. The data collection that we've been um, collecting, data we've been collecting over that corridor. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. That's about all I have. All right, now we're letting you off, off easy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, thank you. Have a good night, Tab. All right, you too. See you capstone engagement, Natalie. Yes, thanks. And I, I do not have a PowerPoint, but I just wanted to provide a brief update um, because I, we recalled, you know, Tab's interest in our engagement with CU um, earlier in 2021. And so we just wanted to update you that we have been um, working with them on a couple of different projects. Um, with the airport, most recently, um, we've been engaging with the College of Architecture and Environmental Design with a group of students who actually reached out to us to um, look at how the, they could come up with designs to make the airport a more like community facing um, asset. And, and so our, um, our airport tenants, some of our airport tenants and also our airport manager, John Kinney um, has been engaging with them on that work. And another um, just bit of good news out of engagement with CU is we've also been, um, there was interest in their aerospace engineering department having an opportunity to come out and utilize some of the space at the airport to develop prototypes for electric aircraft. Um, mm -hmm. And so we're partnering with them on that and they're engaging with some of our tenants to have access to hangar space to do that work. So that's really great. And then, um, we're also working with them on the VZIP evaluation work. So they've done some preliminary, a student from their master's program has done some preliminary evaluation um, of our VZIP treatments. And so they have shared some of those findings with us and, and we'll continue to evaluate those and um, have more information to share probably in late Q1 with Tab about how those things are performing for us. But 
that's all I had. And I'm happy to answer any questions if anyone has any. I don't have any questions. Anyone else? Great, we'll move right along. Thanks, Natalie. That sounds yep. very interesting. Cool. Okay, assuming there are no other matters from staff, we're gonna move now to matters from the board. Looks like we're good. Okay, matters from the board. Um, let's turn to the letter that Ryan um, and Mark worked on. Ryan did email a revised version of the letter and a red line version um, just before the meeting. Uh, I thought I thought the draft was terrific, by the way. Um, and I hope you got some feedback from some other people, but um, does anyone have a proposal of how to revise this or what, what how we wanna proceed? Tila, can I maybe say a word or two for-, for Please folks? do, thank okay. you. Okay, so just, and Mark, you, you can you weigh into here, but just so everybody is on the same page. Um, so we, Mark and I uh, developed this letter and it's, yeah, it's the most recent one this afternoon. Um, that's, that's the updated one. Alex gave me a couple of data points on, on, on some stats that he edited. Um, but just, just to tell you that, you know, we, we tried to um, do the will of the discussion from our last meeting. And um, we really debated some different pros and cons um, of kind of some different framings. And, and then we took a step back as well. Are we sure this is the right approach? Should we be more focused on Vision Zero? Recognizing comments, you know, from Tila and others about arterials. And, um, and it was, you know, this is not easy to focus on one thing, but we, we agreed on this in the end um, for, for a few reasons, uh, this thesis. And yeah, in the end, on this thesis for a few reasons. Um, so one is this allows us, this allows council to compass a number of different of our TMP goals while, while being pretty focused on this, this single one. Mm -hmm. um, it brings together land use and other matters that are that are outside of our, generally outside of our formal scope. Um, that we're not going to get done without council's help. Um, and then this seems to be a topic that our new council, some of the new members are quite interested in. Um, so it, it, it felt like the right thing for, for, for this time. Um, and I have, yeah, I've tried to, so uh, Tila, you've given comments, uh, you get, I talked to you, Alex has get, provided some comments, I tried to make those work together. Hutch, I don't think we've, I've heard from you, so if this is, <laughs> now's your time. Um, but we need to get this into, I think by noon on, on Wednesday, it has to be emailed. So my hope would be we can be good by tomorrow. So either with any edits tonight or um, a deadline of tomorrow late morning, if anything else, and then ask for blessing to, you know, just, just to send this on. Um, mm -hmm. Well, I'm, I'm happy to uh, have you make a comment. And I, I, did, I didn't respond because I'm just, I'm very supportive of VMT as a theme, it's, it's abysmally hard <laughs> and, and, you know, figuring out what to measure and all the wide range of policy drivers to it. Uh, but I thought that you, you guys hit the right set of themes, which is uh, you have to work on VNT as a me overall measurement construct and you have to have a way for those themes to, get, to come together and they don't come together in any existing entity other than the council. And I think you made that point pretty clearly. Uh, so I think at this stage, rather than try to prescribe something very, very detailed uh, for, for the council, since, since you know, the, the only place where the lever sit is with them and they're, you know, they're, they're not city management, they're the council. So they need to think about mechanisms. And that's the one piece that I wasn't quite sure how to work in there was mechanisms because you know, we've got all these entities and all these processes, but uh, what, by what mechanisms do they orchestrate themselves around the VMT theme? Okay. Um. I would kind of please that we are not being too prescriptive about uh, 
how to achieve things, but that this was one, as I say, one big lens that TAB is intending to put in front of a uh, bunch of work going forward. Does this actually reduce VMT or, you know, and, and thereby affect a number of other goals that we have um, articulated as a community and in our TMP as important goals. And so I didn't, I, the, the, the how wasn't as uh, critical to me because the how really is left up to um, the city manager um, the director of transportation and her staff. So I didn't want to step on any further toes <laughs> than we already have with this. I am curious whether Erica or Natalie have any um, response or reaction to what we have in here. I, I, I know that, you know, council's like just one item and be succinct. And we're like, here, here's the biggest cookie we can think of. <laughs> um, and some of the feedback that I gave to Ryan was essentially, you know, fully operationalized and, and achieving results by 2022 is cray cray. <laughs> so, um, so any, any, any gut check, any, uh, you know, real problems or reactions, I would be very interested to hear from you. Thank you so much for, um, I guess, you know, your gut check or whatever about, you know, having uh, substantive results by the end of 2022. That having been said, um, I had a really, really great conversation with Ryan this afternoon. And it, um, I, I think that in this letter that um, both Ryan and Mark have put together, that it really, anchors in a really key point with regard to our transportation master plan and how to begin to um, look through a slightly different lens. We have our goals, but you know, how do we put a strategic flame framework in place to actually achieve those goals and anchor at least one of those elements, in this case being VMT. And um, I told Ryan that, um, I fear the tab is bound to be um, dissatisfied with the end result um, in terms of, and all of us actually, because we wanna do things faster, we wanna do more of it, and we want to have it um, you know, move very quickly. And as you, know, you got a taste of just earlier today, some things aren't able to move as quickly as any of us want. But by the same token, this gives impetus um, to move things forward in a very, um, straightforward and strategic way. And I think, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> I think that um, the input the tab is providing on this is really stellar and really don't have much um, to say beyond that. Not just because I'm choking. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's gonna go in the minutes. The input tab is providing is really <coughs> stellar. <laughs> um, okay. Well, you know, I'm prepared to be uh, to be underwhelmed. Um, no one's ever accused us of undershooting, so uh, I'm pretty pleased with where the draft is at. I suppose what I would like to know is, for many members of TAB having reviewed um, the revised version, the red line version that Ryan sent around around I don't know what time four th four thirty no four. Um, are you okay with those changes? Um, any further revisions? Any further major changes that you have to suggest. Uh, and, you know, if you don't want to sign on, this is your time to say, I don't want to sign on as well. Or I thought this letter was going to go in a different direction. Sheila, can right. I just quickly, just quickly stipulate. So the, the data points that Alex had provided um, in the draft on the second page, there's a reference to, um, we have had a reduction in 20% of VMT mile, vehicle miles and, and serious crashes down 40%. Mm -hmm. um, I believe that should be 29% on the ve on the vehicle miles and on the crashes, it should be a uh, 44% total. Yeah, I thought it was 43 or so, but uh-huh. And 40 and 31% serious. Um, so reflect those or Alex, whatever you. Okay. Yeah, that's that's what I saw from the latest safe streets. I'll, I'll add that, yeah, I'm, I'm supportive of this as is. I uh, uh, appreciate the work that Ryan and Mark have put into this towards the bottom where it lists areas where we should factor in VMT, two areas I would also consider are traffic studies and corridor studies. Those are 
city processes that span both transportation and planning. And we typically plan, or all too often, we plan for an increase in growth in VMT. And those are places where updates to our DCS or, or just general practices could lead to planning for a reduction in VMT. And I think over time, if we planned like that, we would get what we plan for, which right now is growth and in the mm -hmm. future the month productions. So uh, traffic studies and quarter studies are the only two things I would request you consider adding. So to be clear, you would add traffic studies and corridor studies in at the end of the sentence that begins VMT reduction needs to include land use comma zoning comma that that sentence. Yep. Okay. Um, yeah, I was wondering because well because of the work that you Alex and Mark have been highlighting is if, if we should be talking about you know budgeting as well. Um, Policies and activities go beyond the formal scope of TAB. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think the only other thing that jumps out at me still is the phrase fully operationalized um, as at the end of the success could be defined paragraph at the top. Um, as long as we have a plan and are making measurable progress, I don't know that we need to say it has to be like fully in place. Um, I will be uh, pleasantly surprised <laughs> um, if we can manage to to have a plan. And and you know, I did suggest that we we point out work that that staff has already done and can pull off the shelf. If we're talking about dusting things off shelves. Um, and put cobble together a plan. This is not talking about, you know, beginning a whole new public engagement mission, but instead to take the work the staff has done and try to point all of all of it toward VMT reduction, or at least um, view it with a with an eye toward whether it advances um, VMT reduction. Um, even if we can't fully operationalize that plan, because part of that plan might be pursuing TIP grant money that you know, um, has has a big impact on VMT. We're, we're not gonna be able to actually have realized that that goal in 2022 or 2023 necessarily. So I would just take out the be fully operationalized bit. Take out fully? Take out fully <laughs> and operationalize. Is it okay to leave operationalized or something yeah. to that effect that it's, it's being it's, implemented? It's being worked, yeah, okay, I understand, okay. I mean, we're beyond the planning stages of talking about right. the future, you know, like th this is actually happening. What, what's, what's the way with that? Okay, take out fully. Mark, you have, you've been very quiet this whole time. Um, well, I, I wanna say a couple things. One, each draft of this, and there have been substantial changes in, in every draft, the initial ones between Ryan and I. Um, and again, Ryan did the uh, lion's share of the work and uh, I'm really appreciative of that. But um, each draft is improved and I think this latest draft is great. Um, and as far as the operationalized, uh, fully operationalized. I, the message that I want to counsel to hear is that, um, do you, I remember back in the day when we first adopted Vision Zero, you were really against moving towards Vision Zero, right? Okay, so it's like, I don't wanna pl be planning to have a plan that, et cetera. So, um, and, and having a plan doesn't mean we have implemented that. And it doesn't mean that we have an infinite amount of money. It means that we have completed this plan and we've said, okay, now we're starting. We're not planning to start. We have started. And there's, um, you know, so anyway, uh, that, that was, that's really all, all I have to say other than I, in this new version, I think is missing some commas uh, and I'd like to change a couple things in the sense of breaking things into two sentences where they're one very long sentence, 
but I don't know if we need to do that now. If, if we, as, as a board can say, hey, um, this, this conveys our message and uh, we're gonna let Ryan with input from others uh, operating under the uh, correct procedure um, provide the sort of niggling input that I'm referring to, I, I'm ready to go with it. And I really appreciate the, the very latest input that, uh, uh, that other members have provided. Okay, great. Um, Strapple, who's who's okay with uh, approving this current draft um, without uh, realizing there might be a couple of commas or a few word choices, um, but that the substance of the draft will not change and approving it and letting final cleanup go back to uh, Ryan, sounds like he's the main author. Um, to submit to council tomorrow. I'm good with that. Alex looks good with that. Mark's okay. Hutch is good. Okay, we all seem pretty good on that basis. I'm really was very pleased to see the draft that came out. This was um, terrific work, both of you. Thank you so much for that. Um, no other substantive comments here, Tab? Just to confirm, I've got the three points that we heard and I'll, and I'll incorporate those and um, okay. not on the substance of the process, Tila, uh, we can, I don't know if you and I need to talk, but we, I can make sure this gets sent over to, um, I forgot who it is by, by Wednesday, but. I, I think if you forward it to Meredith, then Meredith can take it from there. Is that correct, Meredith? Yes, thumbs up from Meredith. Uh, and I would, when you do so, you're gonna copy tab anyway. Um, but in light of our discussion earlier tonight about the clarity um, and, um, you know, recording verbatim what TAB approves, um, I would request that this be entered into the minutes, whatever the final version is, that it be entered into the minutes for this meeting. Terrific. Wow, well done. Thank you. I think that takes care of this item. All right, Ryan, you'll have time to, to fix it up by tomorrow? Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Thanks so much. All right, any open board comment? We're there already. Alex, oh, that's my hand in front of you. <laughs> Does anyone have an item for open board comment? See, I had a couple things. Mark, okay. you go. You go no, first. no, no, no. You go first. I'm okay. It's fine, Ryan. You go. Is that okay, Tila? Okay. So I just I have three things. Um, these are mostly comments. Um, first one is I just wanted to mark. Uh, this is our first. This is our first meeting. Our first tab meeting since our council new council has been sworn in. I think, or at least, I think it's the first one. So. Um, and I am sure I'm not the only one that's been following meetings. Um, and, you know, I for one have been um, just really kind of um, like, I feel like I'm still trying to get my bearings with the, the new attention this council seems to have on subjects in our TMP, BMT and parking. And um, I, I watched a few times over again so that I could write it down what council member Yates said on Tuesday last week. And I'm just going to read it here, uh, so in case anybody missed it. Um, and this, the, the discussion was on um, on, Vision, on Vision Zero, and he said, uh, "In 2015, council was saying to the transportation staff, why are you being so bold?' And here we are, here we're in 2021, saying to transportation staff, be bold.' So I think we've come a long, long way in the intervening six years, and obviously you're hearing a lot of permission from council to be bold to, to tell us what we need, need to do to protect our community." Um, that starts at two hours and 15 minutes um, of the YouTube video and it raises the question, okay, well, what do you mean by bold exactly? But I, I can um, guess at a lot of this, I think, and I um, think it's worth us giving this some thought in terms of, in discussion, in terms of, um, you know, this is, this is our, the, the executive body that, that gives us tab direction, that gives staff direction, and it is, we are hearing them say, um, you need to 
raise raise the standards. Um, and this might require some clarification from from council. But I just wanted to mark mark that. I think this um, we should we should be able to um, take this take this seriously. And as as we go forward, um, so I just wanted to say that that's my first of and two other comments. But I'm happy if there's any if that stimulates anything from you, Teal or others. I'm happy to. All right. I think keep going. You're okay. on a roll. Okay. Second thing, um, on a on a gloomier note, uh, at our last meeting, I was just um, kind of uh, watching Gene and, and Danny talk. Uh, I was just walking, watching with my mouth open, uh, listening to them describe what an abysmal state our transit service is in, um, where it's still 60% of transit service, not even planning to go back to 85% by 2025. And I, I couldn't, I sort of feel like I must have been missing something. So I asked for them to, to talk, uh, to do a follow-up call. And Jeannie, Daddy, thank you. And they, they clarified, yeah, you got it right, Ryan. They, they were really in crisis. And I'm not sure they used the word crisis. That's, that's my read on it. Um, and I just, I just feel that this is, this is something that deserves some real stone turning. Uh, I, I know it's a common theme that we don't have enough funding at various proposals. But I just, um, it just makes me think like, are we, are we active? Do we have enough active engagement with the governor's office, uh, with our work on federal advocacy to increase the size of the pie? If it's not just, if, if Boulder's not unique, um, we, we have people who live in places that depend on the bus that is gone. Um, and this is a wealthy city. We have, I think median, I just saw the median home prices are like 1.2 million or something. And I just, I just feel like there's a, I'm just experiencing a lot of dissonance between what seems to me such a profound problem and just just kind of seems like, well, that's just sort of is what it is. And maybe I'm, you know, just want to be optimistic and think there's look for solutions. But I, I, I do believe we have at least some ability to engage with higher higher um, jurisdictions that have an interest in this with, with other cities, too. So I, maybe it's just a for the suggestion box, but I wanted to raise that. I think that we, this doesn't get as much attention as it should. And our council, I don't know if our council knows this, does our council understand that we're at 60% transit levels and not gonna be even at 85% by 2025 or maybe it's something like that. Maybe I think it's exactly right. Um, it's, a, it's a big problem. Um, anyway, happy to take any <laughs> comments or questions on that, but just wanna make sure we all see that. Uh, so I haven't been keeping track of who there's different hats to move around um, in terms of city council members uh, being responsible for different things, setting agendas, stuff like that. So I'm not sure who um, the council representative of Dr. Cog is or the liaison with Dr. Cog is right now. Do you know Erica or Natalie? Oh, Erica could look it up. <laughs> um, Nicole Spear. Oh, okay. We got the lawyer on the case. <laughs> uh, that's interesting. Um, Ryan, you're so uh, persuasive. I wonder if you should, we should put you in touch with Nicole Spear directly. Wait till you hear my third one, uh, but I'm happy to if somebody <laughs> else wants to. Yeah, I'm happy to reach out to Nicole if that's if that's the the will. You know, of for 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 some of some of the city council members, especially new ones who know that they don't know everything, they're often very grateful to have, um, you know, someone reach out and say, "I I I have thoughts and uh, and information for you," um, and particularly this is a that's a big role um, for a new city council member, um, you know, and. You're you're the new kid on the block here, but you know a lot. So I would I would certainly support you reaching out to her directly. Okay, and Jean and Danny, feel free to correct anything I said here or, or in the future. Um, but in any case, thank you for your, your help help with orientation. Um, just before we carry on, I just wanted to correct one thing, Keila. Uh, Dr. Spear is a uh, PhD scientist oh, administrator. You're right. She is not a lawyer. You're right. You're right. So, even even better. <laughs> even better. <laughs> All right. Should I should I continue, Tila? Please do. Okay. The third one. Um, what did I say? Okay. So thank you. The shout out to Allison. Thank you, Allison. Um, I just want to do a quick report out. To, sorry, Tila. This is on behalf of our, our field trip to um, the AMPS meeting. The AMPS. Okay. Good. Mm -hmm. know that we did it. So Tila and I attended the uh, the AMPS curb uh, access allies curb curb uh, uh, effort. Management. Yeah. management yeah last week 
Uh, I just want to give some quick impressions. Um, so a lot of there was a number of, of different stakeholders that weighed in, um, and I, you know, there's the early forming stage of it, but I heard a lot of um, the input going into this kind of input um, sort of brainstorming exercise that that highlighted climate um, and, and, and VMT, um, but but there's a lot of stuff going on there. Um, so um, I did not. One thing that I was a little disappointed by is that in the original presentation, I didn't I didn't see the TMP goals. I didn't see that. You know, among the things we're going to do, you know, we already have a TMP with these, you know, a VMT goal, mode shift mm -hmm. goal, climate. So um, I, I had a short follow-up call with Allison. Allison, thank you. Um, I told her that feedback, and she had said, well, it, you know, it is, you know, it's it's in there-ish. Um, and so in any case, just want folks to know that um, we're, we're in dialogue about that. Um, and then the third thing is I, <clears throat> I, I do, I had a question about where does TAB fit into the the org chart, so to speak, mm -hmm. um, and it, it does feel like we're a little peripheral to this. That may just be the facts of life, but I, I want um, Tab to be aware of at least my impression, which is there's a, there's a kind of a couple of organizing bodies that have that, that, that um, some different <laughs> boxes feed up to, and then we, along with a couple few other focus groups, are kind of reporting into a, a comms and engagement um, kind of a section. Allison or somebody could maybe maybe clarify, but this was prompted because um, we, well, Teal, you noticed that and mentioned to me that community vitality was, you know, they weren't there. And I, I said, well, they were pretty instrumental or pretty important to the previous um, AMS engagement. It seems like they should be here, right? And so, but I think the answer that I heard was, well, you know, there's, there's a lot more going on here. And um, so my impression is we're, we'll be heard, but it feels like we're, Kind of peripheral. Um, so just want folks to hear that that question. Okay. Um, I see Allison has come back on camera. Maybe he wants to speak to this, but I just wanted to add one thing before she does, assuming that's what you're trying to do, Allison. Um, uh, yeah, it's it, to to uh, Ryan's point about Tab being peripheral. I would just say it felt like Tab was one of many stakeholders that were identified. And not only were there not, you know, no re reference to the TMP and here's where we want to go, it seemed clear with this group, it was a community outreach engagement exercise that just said, we don't know where we want to go. We're going to have a vision, you know, and a vision statement and an objective, you know, setting thing. And it was, it was just this engagement platform all over again. It's just never clear to me when and how city staff decides, uh, you know, this is now going to be a, a consult or collaborate level. Um, this is public property that the city manager's office and our various like rules of laws and regulations regulate. And if there are changes to those regulations, I don't see why it's put to a community visioning exercise on some of these things. And I guess that that's another level of, of unclarity, you know, why is it that we went to this group of stakeholders to begin with to say, what do you all think in the broadest terms possible and not even begin to point them in a direction that says, you know, serve these BMT goals, serve these, these TMP goals, serve these, if there are, you know, business concerns and goals, point to the guiding planning document to that and say, you gotta, you know, have these guardrails here. And instead it was just sort of a very open-ended we're going to have a big, big conversation about it. And I'm like, why? <laughs> why are we subjecting this to another round of just open-ended community discussion and engagement when we've done this previous times and previous plans and come up with um, some metrics and some things that we do want to achieve? I don't know if Allison wants to answer that. Yeah, I, I can speak to that a little bit and, and a little bit what I shared with Ryan. <clears throat> And then we can, yeah, we can discuss further. But um, it is the um, Access Allies, which is um, what you and Ryan are, are a part of, and we appreciate your time and effort there. Um, that is an advisory group for the curbside management policy and program. Um, so we do have a, a number of advisory groups and focus groups um, as part of that. <clears throat> that initial meeting was to get everyone on the same page because there were a number of people who were not involved with previous AMPS work. So it was meant to be more of a broad um, focus for that meeting. And we are working through the city's engagement framework for that. So 
I certainly understand what you're saying with, um, especially as, as people who have a, a lot of experience in, in the type of work that we do and the projects that we've worked on, that that can be, um, can, can feel repetitive. Um, the purpose of that meeting was so that we could all get on the same page, but I, I certainly hear you and, um, and we can deepen and, and dig in deeper and provide more detail on that um, actual engagement and the purpose of that. Mark, go ahead. I just wanted to, um, I guess, commiserate with uh, and say that in, in my time on TAB, uh, to say that um, TAB is on the periphery of parking issues is an understatement. And, and what you have pointed out, Ryan and Tila, is that when you take a, an issue that deals with critical transportation, infrastructure, and our climate goals, our, our climate crisis, and give it to community vitality. This is the result, you know, when you do that, you have to expect the result that a kind of a merchant-based downtown sort of group um, uh, and it's a city agency, but as Tila said, we are talking about public right-of-way. We are talking about city assets. And um, when you give it to a community vitality group, this is what, this is what the result will be. And, and I think we, should, we are naive if we think anything different is going to happen until um, the responsibility of managing parking is given to a different department. So that's my input. Thanks, Mark. Alex, you have your hand up. Yeah, I was I was happy to pass off my responsibility <laughs> with AMPS and XX allies because I felt it was a very unproductive use of my time and that the consensus building that happened in the meetings was not reflected in what was pushed forward and that there were perhaps some things that we see other communities implement successfully that uh, community vitality had these, it, it wasn't on the table from the get go and it didn't matter what I said. It didn't matter what the consensus of the group was. Uh, we were a checkbox exercise and a process to a predetermined outcome. And so I, I wish you guys luck and I hope you're, uh, you speak up sooner and more often. Thanks, Alex. Okay, I think I'm still left with the question, why, why are we working within this level of the city's community engagement framework? I think that, sorry, Tila, I was just gonna- That's okay. I think, yeah. I think that was the piece that Allison was, was saying that you know we could come back or, or follow up with you. Uh, okay. To talk about. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, talking about the amps was the only thing that I had for open board comment. Um, so thanks, Brian. Yes, Brian. Yeah, can I just, just say one other word on it. I, thank you, everybody. And Allison, thank you for your work on this. I hope this isn't, <laughs> I mean, too, too hard on, on, on you at this. I, I, great. I mean, overall, I enjoyed the dialogue and appreciate you making time. And Natalie, thank you for your for that comment. I just wanted to offer one thing that I, you know, feedback that I'd heard in it, that, that uh, and when I was on a different side of a table in a, in a professional engagement once, and it was, you know, when, when, um, with hey, Ryan and team, when you, you know, when you invite the public to come to give input, we want to know what the decision making process is. Like, we, we want to know, we want to understand, like, is this just the, like, is this just, you're just listening to us and you're going to do with what you want? Or will, is there, is there something that we can do to expect uh, um, that, uh, the, the key decisions that have been identified are going to go to a certain place and like where that's going to play out. And that's, that's one of the things that leaves me just a little bit kind of feeling not that great, which is like understanding, like, like it's pretty clear that there's going to be, there's, there's some, there are going to be some, some trade-offs to make in this process with respect to climate and mode shifting versus a more merchant, you know, sort of oriented approach. And I, you know, I, the question is like, where's that table? Where's that table gonna be? And um, the org chart doesn't reflect the tab's gonna be, you know, in at that table. Maybe we won't, but I'd be, just be good to know um, 
you know, like where that where that is. So I apologize if that was redundant, but I just wanted to share the fact that. Yeah, no, I, I hear that. And it sounds like, it looks like Erica has something to say. Yeah. So I, I guess I just wanna say, I see our job here, you know, as staff is kind of doing the knitting um, after hearing all the different views and perspectives and so forth and trying to knit together things as a, as a whole. Um, ultimately, the table that you're talking about is the table of council. And so we try to give them options and choices and um, they can choose where on a spectrum um, based off of different policy um, impacts and implications. Okay. Um, I, I, that's an interesting analogy. And I guess what I'm saying is I feel like staff already has all the yarn and your guys are going out and soliciting extra yarn made from different kinds of animals and, uh, and no one has a real pattern and we don't even know what shape, are we making a sweater or is it a hat or is it baby booties or is it a Christmas stocking? Um, I think it's a sweater, actually, but okay. You think it's a sweater? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we, yeah, we, we are, especially with the access alleys and focus groups, we are looking to consult and involve those members of the community. Um, so, so there is still pieces to develop, right? Okay. It's, <laughs> which, which is part of our purpose of, of that engagement. <laughs> Yeah, and you know, I've seen Liv in action on you know doing this with the pedestrian um, action committee, and uh, and and uh, she does it really well. I was just like, oh no, <laughs> I've been on this boat before. <laughs> do I have to do this for parking too? <laughs> I thought we uh, I thought we knew what we needed to know for parking, and so I was I'm just yeah, I'm I'm. It's not a critique of how you guys are doing it. It's just a do we really have to do it this way? Yeah, well, I, I will say, sorry, just, just on that note, that it's not just about parking and we're trying to make that really clear throughout sure. the game yes, process. Yes, curbside thank you. And I'll, and I'll say that because um, because some people, and, and I'll even share that like people we interviewed like thought that it is just about parking and that's not what curbside is, so. Fair point, um, fair point. So I, so I just wanted to note that that is not just parking. That's good. To, to like, right. I just say one, one more thing in response to what Erica said. I, I think it's it's insightful that that um, if, the, if the table is with council, and in fact, that is what happened. I think at the last time or last go around where I would you know took it took a visit to council, and the dialogue went something like um, staff saying, "Well, Tab would like us to do more," and then the Tab representative me said, "Yeah, that's right. We'd like you to do more." But staff said, "Can you just do this anyway?" And council said, fine, we'll just do what you're saying. So so if if the game is lobbying council directly, you know, I, that clarity is actually quite helpful that, to know that that you know if if we were gonna do that same exercise again, that council it would benefit from getting a briefing or you know some help from us ahead of time. So it's not all happening within 90 seconds. I don't think that's like really the, the plan design, but if that really is it, I'd I'd be happy to understand that and prepare help to prepare council because it is our job, in fact, to, to prepare council and, and advise them. So So uh -oh, now Erica has to respond. <laughs> I mean, I, I just, I recall it slightly differently that um, council took into, at least in my talking with council members afterwards, that they took into consideration a broad range of things and heard what Tab had said and um, gave some direction to staff to, you know, essentially follow up on some items, but um, felt that they needed to balance a whole array of different mm -hmm. community priorities. And right. I, I think that's how I recall the conversation. Okay. I, I don't feel like belaboring this any further. <laughs> I think we could probably go back and forth all night, but let's not. Uh, does anyone else have any comments of our open board comment this evening? Mark, yes, you had your hand up earlier. Um, okay, I, I and I'll, tr I'll really try to make these go quickly. I, I also have three items. Um, so I just sent you all an email. I, I hope you've received it by now. I didn't set, I, I kept thinking, okay, this is almost over, I, but I don't wanna send it and have it distract from Ryan's discussion. But I wanna talk about the um, fact that our agenda for this month uh, was presented with zero future agenda topics. Um, and uh, 
I would like to, uh, as a board, uh, where we control our agenda to some degree, um, add back in our agenda topics to our agenda. Future agenda topics need to be an item on our agenda. And what I sent in the email, not only should they be part of our agenda, um, I just did a quick little uh, Google sheet um, of an, of an ag future agenda item tracker, because if, you, if, you, if we've all agreed that we're going to do something in the future. Um, one, that's always subject to change. We can change our mind and say, yeah, we don't, we don't wanna do that. We could take it off. But if we've agreed we're going to do something in the future, then let's establish who's responsible for that future item, uh, who's working on it, how long. I think it's informative to see um, how long it's been on the, uh, on the, on the topic list. And if it's, if it's on there forever, uh, we either need to kill it or do it, one of the two. So um, I don't really care how this works, but I, I provided an example. Um, there is a little bit of a question of would, if we decided to track agenda items and attach that either as a table within the agenda, as a second page, whatever it might be, um, would that be maintained by the chair and vice chair as part of the agenda committee um, to make sure that it, we don't violate the uh, Colorado Open Meetings Act? Would it be maintained by staff? But I, 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 those are details. I, want, I, I would like to have the board adopt that we want our future agenda items back on our agenda. Okay, um, I'd like to respond to that. Am I muted? No, I'm good. Um, we, at the last agenda setting meeting, well, at the, the last meeting, we did kind of talk through the items that were there and said, yeah, this one's coming, you know, in three months, this one's on for whatever. This one, definitely, we don't have an answer on. Here's a new one. Um, and then at the agenda setting meeting, uh, we agreed those of us at that meeting agreed that it was just getting too cluttered to carry all of these things forward and that we would clear off the ones that we had um, decided were going to be taken care of at some point that were you know floating somewhere on a future agenda um, with the exception of the potential um, crosswalk treatment matrix mark that you had um, proposed and that I would I said I would circle back to you and see if you were ready at this next meeting or not so it's still you know floating there but you're right it's not on our agenda um, it hadn't in years past these these lists didn't get carried forward um, I'm very open to having a discussion again I think at our retreat probably about how we're going to function as a board and what are the rules and what are the expectations because this past couple months is the first time in my five years on the board I've ever seen anything like a keeping keeping track of um, of some of these items because sometimes they come up and it's not clear um, when they'll be addressed or whether they'll be addressed. I think, for instance, the Clay Fong presentation on your um, proposed tracker and the email that you had just sent um, we've got sort of folded into some larger discussion, I think you emailed after the last meeting and had some very good points about why that's not adequate and not the same. Um, that's a very useful conversation to have, but in, in substance, that's why the stuff came off, um, uh, off of this agenda. Um, quite curious to hear what other um, TAB members feel about whether it should be uh, carried on as, as a matter of just the public record going forward, here's what our agenda is and our future agenda topics, because to put them as agenda topics, as a, as a future agenda topic item is to some extent, put things on staff's work plan that may or may not be there. Any response to any of that, Mark? Well, I'm, I'm curious what other other board members uh, think. Okay. But I, yeah, I'm happy to respond, but let's let's let someone else okay. for a second. Well, this is Hutch. Um, uh, 
agenda management to me is always pretty important because it it essentially says what we're going to think about and what we're going to do and there's always more things in the, that than what we are going to meet on that are interesting and important uh and i can certainly see the list always being longer than we actually execute uh so i resonate a little bit with mark that you know, having a list somewhere of the stuff we've talked about that we haven't decided to use our, you know, very important allocated time on makes sense. But I actually like the flexibility of saying, well, for, for a while, we thought that that really should be on the agenda. Uh, but when we do our check-ins to that agenda, and maybe it's not all of us, maybe it's just the chair or the chair and vice chair, uh, that's not making the grade. So uh, to, to me, there's a little bit of a just watching that list element, but I don't feel a vast sense of responsibility that every time something comes sniffing around and comes close to the agenda, we absolutely have to do it. Mm -hmm. I think it's a good suggestion that the chair um keep a keep a track uh, keep track of this stuff um certainly one of my my critiques of previous years um is that often things will you know they'll make it on the agenda we'll get through them in the meeting there might be outstanding questions no one ever follows up there's a request for the records it's not clear from the records of tab even before i was on tab whether those requests got followed through um but definitely there were there were things that you know just got kind of forgotten um because they, they just sort of fell off the radar. That's often with past agenda items, um, the required follow-up more so than future agenda items, but um, I am definitely in favor of, of you know, writing stuff down <laughs> and keeping track of it. And so, um, as I said, I feel like this is probably more of, um, if we wanted to formalize something, then it would be part of this, these rules and procedures and regulations that's, um, apparently going to be a large part of our retreat um, this next year. Um, but in the meantime, I appreciate the effort that you've gone through, Mark. And um, yeah, I, this now is your time, I think, to, to respond to what I said. Oh, Ryan's come off mute. So just maybe a, Ryan will see that. Thanks, Sue. Just a question mark and a comment. I, th I, I think what I heard, the question is, I think I um, was hearing you suggest that, like, like part of the implication is that we would take, we would, and having this table, we would make it. We would make decisions about taking things off of it. So, but I, but so that's more than just having a kind of a rolling tracker that we that we have. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know that I feel that strongly. The way I like the idea, I guess step one of having something that I can remember, we we can recall. Um, and I don't feel super strongly about the the formality that mechanism. But so anyway, thank you for clarifying. Okay. Um, and I think this is a great, great step forward. I will say the thing that the thing, the related thing that um, rubs me the most is is thinking about some of the future topics that tab members have not add, asked to add, but that I know are in the future that I would expect to want to prepare for some of the bigger planning exercises. If there's a you know climate or TMP or whatnot, I don't want to see that two weeks to go. I want to be able to understand, you know months out ideally if there's a going to be some sub, substantive issues that i like to research that might be too tall of an order that might just be like we don't we can't do that but i just want to you know in case that resonates with others so anyway thank you mark for getting us started sure okay um unless does anyone else want to go i i want to respond to a couple of things um in in listening to uh, my own thoughts in my head and, and to uh, hearing other, other TAB members. I think about three things. Um, one, I, I, I want to be clear that to put something on the list, it's not just like, oh, I want to put it on the list. I'm going to type it in. No, this would, this would go through something like what happened uh, last meeting when I said, gee, I wanted to add this. We discussed it. It was a close vote. And, uh, and so it, it eventually got added, but it didn't get added just on a whim or because someone uh, had access to the sheet and typed it on. So to get something on, it needs to go through the process. The other 
goal here is accountability. At, at, at any time, if it's if it's really worth having on the agenda, then let's either let's uh, let's let's have the accountable parties um, act upon it, put their presentation together, whatever, and and let's let's get it scheduled. Um, or and the, and the and the third thing is decisions. Uh, you know, there's there's uh, I think it's a great thing to change our mind and say, yep, that wasn't you know six months have gone by and uh, you know scooters are off the street and hence we don't need to discuss uh, scooter safety if that was one of our items. Uh, gee, and we want to take it off. This gives us a mechanism. And, and, and in a way, an incentive, if our list keeps getting longer and we get up to 10 or 12 items on future agenda topics, then I would advocate, yeah, let's, what do we want to cut because life is short and time is limited. So I, I am not about having this list get long. I'm actually about doing those things mm -hmm. or cutting those things. Mm -hmm. Okay. So how about this? Uh, I, I know we need to resolve things and move on. Um, I'm happy w based on last month's minutes or last month's agenda. Um, right. Anyway, to um, uh, maintain this until we, um, uh, until we go to our retreat and we can formalize it then if we want, in, unless people want to formalize it now. Um, but if we want to delay that formalization for a future agenda topic, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, anyway, I'm, I'm willing to maintain it temporarily. If, if everybody says, yeah, I think that's a good idea, then great. Then, then I, I, it's not, it's not really, it shouldn't be a big deal, um, to have, uh, have our future agenda up topics tracked. Okay. So I just want to reiterate the way that we did it last month was just sort of provisionally trying out, um, you know, something in those draft policies and procedures right. like, oh, this was, you know, a mechanism that got proposed. Um, so I, I, when you say I'm happy to maintain this, you mean the list that you have emailed? Yeah, that, that okay. was not a complete list. I actually, yeah. 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 Okay. Um, I'll, I'll take you up on that offer. <laughs> Okay, do we have agreement that um, we will uh, formalize this at a future date, probably the retreat, but in the meantime, um, I'll maintain it? That is my understanding. Is that square with everyone else on tab? Brian nodding, Alex nodding, Hutch raises his hand. All right, thank you, Mark. Okay, um, so speaking of future agenda items, uh, I have one, and that is that the one I committed to, which is um, tackling mm -hmm. a presentation and advocacy of an NSMP-like process um, for pedestrian crossings. Um, and so I have uh, two requests, um, and I'm very cognizant of uh, both in the proposed uh, rules of procedure and in general, good good uh, governance. That it's uh, it's not cool to ask staff to uh, spend a lot of time on board requests. Um, so, but for me to put together a presentation with really any sort of data, what I'm requesting is if uh, Ryan or any other staff members have produced presentations in the past or given presentations to other uh, transportation agencies, communities um, about the NSMP's success. Because I, again, I think it's a real success and I think we've gone out and presented it to other communities as success is I, I would like to get copies of those presentations. I'm not asking for collection of data but if we have data collected and it's in some sort of format, gee, I'd like to see it and I'd be happy to sort through it and to minimize anyone's staff time. But uh, I would request that uh, 
if there's things that would help my case, uh, and I'll, I would like to be the judge of that, that I would like to get a bunch of NSMP stuff that's already prepared and have it sent to me, please. Eric, I'm gonna let you handle that one. So a qualified yes, and the qualification is that um, basically from now until um, mm -hmm. just a little while before the council retreat, it's all hands on deck at this moment for um, trying to get information to council. And sure. so that is my reality. Um, sure. So we'll go back and we'll see, you know, if it's, if it's easy to do, you know, after that, um, you, know, you know, just sort of pull stuff or whatever, certainly we'd be happy to share it with you. Great. That's, that's all I ask. Thank you very much. That's a, a great answer. And, uh, and I, again, fully cognizant of, uh, you know, I think the, in, the entire city is producing their letter, action item requests, et cetera, to council right now before the retreat. So anyway, um, that's great. The, the second one on the same topic is, um, is Erica, uh, uh, and again, you may do this after uh, your retreat preparation. Uh, yeah, in our last meeting, um, you had stated that, there, that you all do have a rigorous process for um, pedestrian crossing treatments or, or treatment of public requests uh, from citizens. So um, if you have such a thing, I would love to get a copy of, uh, of that process of how you currently deal with crossing requests or other, other public process requests. Okay, I'll follow up with staff and see what we have. Okay, thank you. Okay, that was it for my second one. And um, the third one is, I think this is primarily for Erica and Natalie or, or anyone else on staff. I have perceived, and I, I, I don't have any data or anything else to back this up, but a reduction in, uh, and this may be due to staffing or whatever, of responses to community members and to TAB members when we write to staff. Um, and so I would like to know, and this is actually kind of a confusing thing for me, what is our policy for responding to TAB communications and, and public requests uh, might be for more information or, gee, I've got this, my perception is my street is in terrible condition, whatever it might be. Um, but I've seen a bunch of, you know, emails from the public go by. I've, I'm also, I send my own emails into staff and um, uh, I haven't received much of a uh, reply and nor have I seen much of a reply to other citizens. So do we have a policy? And if so, what is it? Or is it kind of an ad hoc thing in the moment? So I would say it's something that's evolving um, because there's a lot of commentary that comes in that is along the lines of, I don't like this, or <laughs> I want you to do this. And um, that's, that's a comment, that's a piece of input, but it doesn't necessarily need to be responded to. If there's a factual question, um, we try to be able to respond to that. Um, and sometimes it's, it's taking us a little bit longer um, to do so. And if things have gotten you know, caught in the cracks, I would invite you to resend your email you know, directly to me and then I'll follow up with that. Okay, thank you. Um, and I, I will say that in particular, the, the item that uh, is of great interest to me is um, I had suggested three action items in regard to the 15th Street pedestrian crossing, which was uh, the way we phrased the task to our consultant, a meeting uh, at the, a, a publicly noticed meeting at the site. Um, I think that's important in that particular case. 
and um, and then a uh, a request for a tab review uh, once the uh, consultant has come back with their um, product. So uh, I don't expect any answers to those tonight, but but those were my my uh, my letter was uh, I hope not perceived as just a complaint, but it was actual um, process request uh, regarding that particular project. So we also talked about your letter uh, briefly at the agenda setting meeting. Um, you know, the NSMP has this like process and here's how many touch points tab has. Um, this kind of project doesn't have that set of guidelines. Um, but it is for, you know, for better or worse, not subject to the public engagement network that talking about curbside management is uh, it's 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 really unclear to me what level of public engagement and back and forth um, is required on different projects. That being said, staff has limited time and effort. They don't have to consult us at all on these projects. Um, for whatever reason, they did consult, um, not just us, but Community Cycles. They consulted us a couple of times. Um, and as an advisory board, we don't really have the authority and power to say, you staff ought to direct your consultants to do this. You need to conduct this another, you know, another round of public outreach. That's not our job. I feel that we've had our chance. I feel that staff has listened to us. They did adjust the design. Um, but we're advisory. This is their job and their um, purview. And this is the amount of effort that they've decided that they're gonna do um, and that this project deserves. I think it's not perfect. I think, um, and you know, we've said this at the last meeting, I'm not thrilled, it's better than it was. But staff gets to decide. That's all. That's all that they're going to do. And I think the staff has decided. They've they've listened to us. Thanks for our advice. They're going to move on, and we can keep pestering them. And hopefully, we'll do better in the future. Well, Tila, thank you for a direct and clear um, response. As um, that that you know again i i am all about clear and direct communication and decisiveness and so if if in fact thank you for uh you know uh speaking for staff and yes i acknowledge all of those things and i have repeatedly acknowledged that we are an advisory board however at times i have regretted not being clear enough or strong enough in my positions. And mm -hmm. I decided that with this project, I, I don't want to have that regret that, that my input was inadequate or unclear. And so again, staff is free at every turn to say, go pound sand. Thank you very much for your input. Um, and uh, so, but, but I was actually looking for was exactly what you told me. And that is, yeah, thank you, no. Uh, and, um, you know, your, your three requests, items one, two, and three are answered with no, no, and no. So that now I know what the answers are. So thank you. So that concludes my portion of my <laughs> Thank you, Mark. <laughs> Anyone else? Alex. I've gotten some questions and inquiries about the protect lanes on Folsom, which are of course a project I support. 
However, I am I'm incapable of answering some community questions as to why certain things were done the way they were. And I feel that it's about, I don't know, 16 months between TAB providing some very informal conceptual feedback and a final design being implemented. And it, 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 that's one where it seems like we were, we were sort of excluded from the design process. We get three opportunities to weigh in on a single speed bump, but when we overhaul a half mile of an arterial, we get, we get one touch 16 months in advance. And so I, I, I'm out there supporting the project, but I'm, I, I don't know why that curb is that way. I don't know why there's a gap here, but not a gap there. Um, and, and we weren't able to, I think it's a disservice to the project because we weren't able to either hear staff's rationalization or turn to community members to help us get an understanding of the design and that input ultimately uh, influence the final design. Uh, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead, Ryan. Well, I think, Alex, you're making a kind of a procedural point, but there's also a substantive one, which is, yeah, we, there was at least one person who said, or I'm not sure if that's the right way to put it, but hey, this is dangerous. And I'm just, I don't know. Like, I mean, I've, I've written it a little bit. I, I don't have a, so I'm just sort of curious on like, yeah, is this, to, what, what is it uh, to, what is there to the feedback that the um, I think it's just the low kind of curb sort of style, but anyway, I'm just curious. I don't know. Erica? So I was going to ask Natalie to speak to this a little bit, but basically, you know, we've actually done a lot of design, a lot of outreach, a lot of engagement with community cycles and have listened to the cycling community extensively and really tried to lean in to do the right thing. And then we have a differing group of cyclists that have different opinions around stuff. And so we're trying to work through, we're not entirely done yet. And so we're trying to work through things to be able to, um, you know, to polish it off, et cetera. And I think that if you have specific questions about why something is the way it is, we'd be really, I mean, we'd be very happy to explain that. Um, you know, if you have a specific question about it, I mean, we certainly have gotten the same comments that you've seen about a bicyclist or a cyclist or, you know, an individual saying, I don't believe X um, is safe. But um, on the same token, we've gotten input from a whole cohort of others that said, this is what we need to feel and be safe. So um, we're trying to figure out how to navigate that. Can I just yeah. say thanks to Erica, just, just real quick, just so you know, I don't know if people notice this, but Susan, I don't know how to say her last name, Shima, she right. had given feedback and then she joined, she tried to join the meeting. I think she got the public comment wrong. So in case she's still paying attention, just so that's known that she, she actually tried to be here. Yeah, and she sent an email December 8th, so. Yeah, I don't, I mean, I don't know if there's anything to add to what Erica said. I think we have been in, we were engaging with community cycles as we were um, finalizing the, the design for Folsom and what the curb was going to look like and where the gaps were going to be. Um, and, and I think we had gotten to a, a pretty good place with community cycles as far as, um, you know, what they expected to see along the corridor. Um, and as Erica said, you know, we're still making refinements. We still have the Dells to install that will be installed later this week um, to help with visibility concerns of the curb, especially once snow starts falling. So, um, you know, we're, we're definitely open to continuing to hear feedback and, and definitely reach out to us with questions because we can probably help answer some of those questions. Um, but yeah, that's what we've got at this point. Okay, with, with NSMP, we, we have a proposed project and then we hear from a variety of opinions, those who think it's a fantastic thing, those who think it's a waste of money, and then a council appointed board of people who have been briefed on 
this topic and, and many related ones are then able to provide a, a formal recommendation that then staff and council can rely upon. And with, with Folsom, we seem to have sort of deliberately gone a different route, excluding tab from that process and, and not making that information available to us or, or asking for a formal recommendation where we could hear from a vehicular cyclist who might tell you why curbs are bad and you might hear from a, a interested but concerned cyclist who will tell you how they're not gonna ride on Folsom without them. And what are we here for if not for helping wade through the available information and public input and helping city staff and council land on, on resolutions? So I guess the only point I would make is the NSMP is, you know, in the tabs charter um, as far as your role with the NSMP. Um, and, 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 and I think, you know, we're happy to explore how we engage with tab on these types of um, treatments going forward. You know, as, as you all know, we're, we're kind of building, um, how we're implementing Vision Zero projects as part of our PMP, the Pavement Management Program. And so I think um, we're open to feedback about how we engage in that process. And, um, you know, honestly, I can't remember the details of when we were last at TAB with that concept. Um, yeah. But as Erica, as Erica mentioned, you know, we were, we did do extensive outreach with community cycles. Um, and, and I'm not and so, excited to that though. Like I, I'm, I'm being asked by community members who I don't know questions I can't answer. And it's way more central to what we do than a detour on baseline. Like there, there's so many things that we spend time on that, that seem to be similar or, or less central to what we're asked to inform you and city council on then something as significant as changing the look and feel and function of an arterial street. Erica? So, would it help if we put together just a little um, fact sheet for you so you could answer the questions that um, you have? I've heard, I've heard your concern about providing input. Um, that's part of our broader discussion on how to get all these different projects, getting alignment and the transportation master plan and so forth. I committed to progress, not perfection. Mm -hmm. um, still working on that, um, but I've heard what you've said and for the immediate concern about being able to answer questions, um, we'd be happy to put together a, um, a little, you know, FAQ sheet or something, if you think that would help. I think that would help the general public. I think instead of coming to us and then us having to ask staff and us, you know, going through, yes, to anticipate these kinds of what, what's going on, why is this here, why is this changing, that's, that's definitely something that should be very public facing and easy to find and easier to find than the email address of a tab member. Um, it all still comes back to, I think, a question that keeps recurring this evening. When, when, when do you engage? Who do you engage? Why do you, how do we determine who we talk to? When do we talk to? How, how much input and how much, uh, how much handholding versus, you know, just inviting comments and writing it down and proceeding apace do we do? It's super not clear. And I appreciate Natalie calling out the, uh, you know, that the NSMP is in our charter. Um, it's actually like traffic management or whatever, you know, the previous name of the NSMP was, but also there's a catch all section that says any and all transportation issues. So um, the charter is not much help here, except to say something like the NSMP is explicitly described, but all other transportation things, i.e. the way that Alex I think well summed up the changes that went on a major bicycling corridor in the center of the city ought to have been fairly central to what we do. Um, it's, it's not a concern we need to, we will be able to sort through tonight. 
Um, but yeah, this, uh, the public engagement framework that the city is anticipating, it's not at all clear when and how we apply it. And it doesn't seem to be serving us well, at least in this context. And it's interesting because, you know, I've been having a lot of conversations with our community engagement folks about how to have, create a, um, a clearer and more um, focused, but also expedited process. And because in order to realize many of the expectations that not only all of you have, you know, to with the VMT, you know, strategy, et cetera, but also the um, expectations that the community has, it eventually, you know, it's like you have to have a pathway that's clear and consistent for all the different things that um, we touch and engage in. And at some point, something needs to get done. Right. Choice needs to be made because otherwise it's just um, circling and circling and circling. And yeah. um, so I think, you know, together, not just tap at the community, and then we will be able to come up with that sweet spot. We're just not there yet. Yeah. Okay. We have to stop planning to plan, start doing to do, and be able to explain why we're doing what we're doing. Can I quote you on that? <laughs> Please. It's being recorded as I understand. It'll be in the minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Mark, yes. I just wanted to weigh in on this topic for just a second. And I and I, I concur with everything Alex has said. And and I just occurred to me to hearken back to 20 is plenty. When we decided to do 20 is plenty after lots of tab requests for 20 is plenty in a few places, suddenly we have 20 is plenty across the city. But it was, it, was, it was presented as a very big thing. And it, we, you know, Bill brought the big orange uh, new 20 is plenty sign to tab. And we kind you know, we celebrated and it was a, um, you know, it was significant. And, and TAB was not only included, it was brought along and it was a, a big moment because that's a big deal. So is the first permanent physical, uh, um, physical, physical vertical barrier for a bike lane on an arterial in Boulder. That's, that's big stuff. And um, so uh, I, I would urge staff to, you know, rather than um, uh, think, well, we don't have time to take it to tab. How can tab help us with this? And, uh, and how can we engage with them to, to help so that tab can help bring the community along? Because we are community members that are well connected. You know, the transportation department, as far as I know, doesn't have a Twitter account. Well, some of us do. I, there are things that um, that we can do to help, and um, uh, you know, I, I I think back to the 28th Street mashup that we had, and had staff actually sold us on and sought our input and sold us on some of the changes to 28th Street, we may not have had the, the, the kind of thing that I think staff doesn't like, like us making a recommendation to council um, uh, that runs counter to uh, staff's agenda. So I think there are examples of a couple of opportunities that um, you can, you can uh, bring us along and we can be part of the team or you can surprise us and we can um, look and say, gee, Community Cycles got this briefing. We didn't. And why is that? Um, so uh, that's, that's my comment. Gee, I was hoping to like um, end on a little rosier note than that. <laughs> <laughs> I 
And I would also just like to assume that we're all working toward the same thing. I think we have fundamental disagreements about the best ways to communicate what the best thing is and the best, uh, well, the, the more the preferred option on design at times is certainly something we, uh, we differ on, but there are, with rare exception, uh, in general, the changes that we see on city streets that we're all working toward are improvements on the status quo. And that's all I can ask for us to do better every day and better every year for our community. We can end on progress is good. Thank you. Can we end? Do I have a motion to adjourn? Oh, future agenda topics, have we exhausted that one? I'm At the moment, that one. <laughs> <laughs> At the moment we have. <laughs> I move to adjourn. I'll second that. <laughs> All right. All in favor? Thank you, guys. This has been edifying. We will be in touch and we will see you in the new year.